long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series. As always, I am your host, constant reader Scott Daly, and this cute little baby spider telepathically threatening me right now is my co-host, Matt Freeman. Hey, Spider Matt, how's it going? I told you Mia was she lob, Scott. You did. You did tell me that. And let me tell you, Matt, how crazy everyone following along went when you said that. See, I'm just proving the Lord of the Rings method. This is, It's the tried and true method of analyzing stories. You can apply it to any story. Any story where the author has said, this is my Lord of the Rings. <laughs> we'll get there, though. We'll get there. This week on the show, it's the beginning of the end, Matt. We're here to talk about the first four chapters of the final novel in the Dark Tower series, aptly titled The Dark Tower. We're here already. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's, it's it's kind of weird. I, it, uh, uh, <laughs> honest, honestly, seriously, it feels like the, everything has flown by up till this point. So I agree. I agree. Yeah. It has been it has been 11 months since we started the show and it doesn't feel like it at all. And we're here. And it's weird because like we're not close to the end of the show because this this book is going to take a while, but it still feels like we're, we're approaching the end. Um, and that's partially because the book itself has that tone of the, that we're rushing to the ending. This is a book that I think you saw in the, in the first four chapters here and you will continue to see. This is a book that is like is like careening to the finish line. It's it, it feels like things are moving very, very fast. Yeah, there's certain stuff that happens today that I'm going to have that, like, like the, it's going to sound like I'm criticizing and I'm just all I'm doing is pointing out things he's doing for us to talk about. But yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, I think overall, my impression on reading these four chapters this time was, man, there's a lot of stuff here. <laughs> he's yeah. he's throwing a lot of stuff at us um, very, very quickly. And he's just like trusting the audience who just kind of, OK, OK, let's go with it. Um, yep. Um, so let's waste no time and get into talk about all that individual stuff. So as always, when we're at the beginning of one of our books, we're going to talk about the book as a whole for a couple minutes. Um, as I mentioned before, The Dark Tower is the final novel in this series, not counting the wind through the keyhole, which we will be talking about. We will be covering after we finish this book. Uh, this book was released in September 2004, a mere three and a half months after Song of Susanna came out at 845 pages and 272,000 words. It is the longest book of the series, and we will be spending 13 episodes on it. I wish I could have gotten it up to 19, Matt, but it just didn't <laughs> just didn't work. It's also notable in the series because it sees uh, artist Michael Whalen, um, the artist who drew the original illustrations for The Gunslinger over 20 years ago, is back and he's doing the illustrations in this book, including the illustration on the cover, or the, at least the original cover, that uh, I happen to think is, is a wonderful image. This is the very iconic image of Roland standing in front of the tower holding the rose in his hand. Um, he's got a hat, which he doesn't have a hat, but, you know, whatever. It's fine, Michael. Yeah, I feel like maybe he's had hats at different points in time, and maybe he just happens to have a hat here. Or maybe it's just a horrible mistake. Or Yeah, I'm going to look like an idiot when we get to the part in this novel where it's like, and Roland picked up the hat. Yeah. Like, Shit, I forgot he about that. Picked up a, he took Indiana Jones' hat from Indiana <laughs> Jones because they were friends at that point in the story, because that's how fucking weird the story is going to get, I assume. I, I love that, like, that is completely plausible, and <laughs> it could happen. You just don't know. Yeah, yeah. All right, so before we get into the chapters, I want to stop and talk about the quotes, because there are, once again, three quotes at the very beginning of this novel. Um, one is from a poem, and two are from songs. The first is the final lines of... Robert Browning's Child Roland to the Dark Tower came. And I'm going to read it for you here, Matt. And I just want I just want you, after I finish reading it, to tell me what this makes you feel about what this book is going to be. Not here, when noise was everywhere. It told, increasing like a bell. Names in my ears of all the lost adventurers, my peers. How such a one was strong, and such was bold, and such was fortunate, yet each of old. Lost, lost, one moment knelled the woe of years. There they stood, ranged along the hillsides, met to view the last of me, a living frame, for one more picture in a sheet of flame. I saw them and knew them all, and yet, dauntless the slughorn to my lips I set, and blue, child Roland to the dark tower came. So, Matt, what do you think? What do you think? I mean, the image that comes to mind, which is not what you asked exactly, but the image that comes to mind is is this child Roland is coming to the dark tower alone, all of his friends are dead and not with him, um, which is a sad image. I mean, it, the, the whole 
the whole feeling here is mourning all of the the fallen heroes who who had accompanied him on his journey but not made it to the end right yeah um, yeah that, that's that is what this is saying um and it feels very very sort of tragic and bittersweet yeah i mean it's literally of all the lost adventurers my peers how like he's he's hearing the tolls of this bell um like it's noise in the air as he approaches his tower the tower tolling like a bell and and that tolling is the names of all the people and in his ears of he's everyone he's lost along the way his friends the bold ones the strong ones the fortunate ones yet each of old each they're all gone lost lost one moment knelled the woe of years so as he's approaching the tower he's remembering everyone that has come with him on this journey that has been lost on the course of this journey and he is alone uh, but but there they stood ranged along the hillsides met to view the last of me a living frame for one more picture i love that like it, that the people surrounding him on the hillsides as he approaches the tower are the frame that makes the picture that is child roland right yeah yeah it's a beautiful That's image great. in a sheet of flame i saw them and i knew them all <laughs> it's yeah. so, that's such good and yet, and yet dauntless, the slughorn to my lips. And yet, as I see the memories of the people I've lost along the way, I, I will not stop. I, I am dauntless. I will continue and I will blow the horn at the foot of the tower. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, like this, I think you're right that this is what, what we don't know how this book is going to end. We don't know how this series is going to end. But if you just take these last two stanzas of this poem that King has said are the sources of inspiration for his his novel uh, loose inspiration um it doesn't leave you with a, a rosy image of the end um yes correct he, he's gonna get there yeah i mean as we're gonna go through these intro quotes everything here suggests um sad <laughs> sad and bad so uh that 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 one that one is a you know he gets there, but it's sad, I guess, is the image, yeah. is, is yeah. the feeling I'm getting there. Yeah. But I, I just, dauntless the slughorn to my lips I set. He, like, he's not going to stop. And yet, dauntless the slughorn, the slughorn to my lips I set. Uh, he, it, it doesn't matter. No, mm -hmm. He's not, he won't be, he won't be deterred. He won't be stopped. And that yeah. certainly seems like our Roland. That's true. Yeah. Um, the next quote is from um, Bad Company. Um the, as this is a song and the songs the quote at least in the the text here is i was born six gun in my hand behind a gun i'll make my final stand and what's what's lovely about this one matt is this is not the actual quote of the song uh -huh. <laughs> the actual quote of the song i was born a shotgun in my hand behind a gun i'll make my final stand um and so king is like i'm gonna quote it but i'm gonna change it to make it work for me yeah, which he's done a few times, right? And I, I mean, I think the fun thing that he's done in this series is that for all we know, um, Stephen King is he, basically he's allowed to, to make the quotes be whatever he wants at this point because he's established that the books are being written by Stephen King, mm -hmm, who's, mm -hmm. who's kind of an idiot and, and makes a lot of mistakes in his in his books, like putting... Uh, putting various parts of New York in the wrong in, in the wrong areas and so forth, and so if he makes a mistake in his intro quote, well, you know, Stephen King. Yeah, he's given himself an out, right? Forever. Forever. Yeah. Forever. Exactly. Which I, I mean, and, and in in more seriousness, I mean, this could be the version of that song from Eddie's World, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It certainly could. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be much more fitting because it would be personalized to Eddie. And, and that's the thing about worlds that exist only for the purpose of stories. The things line up to work for your characters and because they, they are the priority in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which good is point. just a great little detail. I love it. Um, the final quote here is from a Nine Inch Nails song written by Trent Reznor. This is the song Hurt um, that I think. I th I think the Johnny Cash version of the song is the one that sticks in my head the most because I think it's such a beautifully sad version of the song. But um, again, not another, not a positive quote, right, Matt? We have, what have I become? My sweetest friend. Everyone I know goes away in the end. You could have it all, my empire of dirt. I will let you down. I will make you hurt. So again, like if we, if we look at this from the perspective of Roland, that, that doesn't say a lot of good things about his content. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, I think the thing is that like I, we're talking like you talk about spoilers or Stephen King, you know, t 
telling us what's going to happen. The thing is, we've known these truths from the beginning, right? This is this is who Roland is, and and the the big question is 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 this a prophecy fulfilled as far as Roland is the type of person that's always going to do this to people. He's always going to, all these characters said in the very beginning that like, you know, he's probably going to sacrifice me for the tower. Um, he's probably yeah. going to happen. Now we're getting there. Is that truly how it's going to be? Um, that's yeah. the big question. Yeah. That, uh, I guess, I guess that's right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where, that's where I'm, that's where I'm at. Right. Like I've, I've mm -hmm. pretty much, I pretty much staked my sort of, half prediction half hope that i mean a lot of these people probably are going to get sacrificed on the way there i just yeah i just hope that he doesn't sacrifice literally everyone because i would just be i would see that as just like oh so this was the story of a guy who sacrificed everything and then got what he wanted yeah yeah <laughs> right um yeah i i also I, I like taking this from the meta perspective i like taking all these quotes at the beginning of these books as this is um, Stephen King using these to reflect his characters, but I also like the idea of Stephen King use these, using these to reflect himself. Like just the fact that this is this is the end of the series that has defined his life, um, or, or at least spanned his life. Yeah, this yeah. is it. He's writing the last book now, and he puts in the final lines of the quotes at the beginning of the book: "I will let you down. I will uh -huh. make you hurt. Uh -huh. uh, you, the reader, right? Like, like." you're I, i'm gonna there's no way i can meet your expectations basically if you've been following along with this thing from the very beginning if you've been reading these books since i published them you have been waiting for 20 odd years for this story to end and there's no way i'm gonna meet your expectations. <laughs> that's really interesting because um, everybody talks i mean not not everybody but many people and, and our guest julia last week mentioned this idea that you know she she gets sad i get sad when when a, when a book ends right mm-hmm and when you're reading a, an epic series like this, I, I think it's quite natural to get very sad, especially if it was a sad ending. Like it, it's a it's a double to double whammy because like the story yeah. is done. You're out of that world now. And if, if it was a sad ending, then you're just I, I don't know. It can be quite devastating, right? Yeah, definitely. Just a, so. another comment on the song Hurt. I mean, it, it actually came out originally in 1994. 95 yeah. actually uh one of those hard to tell exactly and it wasn't until 2002 that johnny cash released the cover and then this book came mm -hmm. out in 2004 so it seems likely to me that the version that king actually has in his mind might actually be the johnny cash version yeah because that would like be that. the one that would be playing around the time when he's writing the book you know um yeah i mean with, it's it, sorry go ahead well the reason i mention it is just like it's very the, the johnny cash version is very different it gives you this sense of okay this is an old man a, 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 an old man sort of looking back over his life and he's lost all of his loved ones due to to basically just the passage of time and he's full of of sadness and regret and um and just kind of burdened by loss and that's a very different vibe i think than you know trent reznor singing it where you're getting the idea of like uh this is a younger person who has who has maybe driven everyone away yeah, because of, I, I think addiction and struggles yeah. with substance abuse and yeah, 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 right. It just it gives you a very different vibe, even though the lyrics are exactly the same, pretty much, pretty much exactly the same. Yeah, um, and while both of those versions of the song, I think, speak to King on different levels, mm -hmm. I, I do think you're right that for an author and a character who is coming to the end of the the quest that has defined their lives, uh, the Cash version does seem a little bit more poetic in that mm -hmm. yeah i like your point though that either one of them could work for stephen king yeah you know, and, and this, yeah knowing stephen king i think he's thinking like I, I do think he recognized that i think he was like oh this is both i like this i mm -hmm. like this um yeah yeah man love it all right are you ready you yep. ready to jump into it let's, let's do, do it. it let's begin part one the little red king or dan tet um which we'll have a lot to say about that that very that very pointed word that I love so much because it means little prince right or, but it, it means prince but it also means little savior yeah um, just it's uh, not that I'm going to be pronunciation police because we we don't really give a shit on this podcast but the, the 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 audio book actually says Dan T D what yeah that's weird yeah. I guess there is an extra e there. Yeah, I've never said it in my head that way in my life. Uh, I I don't think I would have either. I'm just 
I'm just saying it now so that we can. Because everything's tet, right? So you just want to say tet, even though there is an extra E there. Wow. I I don't think I would have said, I think I would have said teet because it's, you know. Yeah, it would have made, it would have made it long, right? Or short. But no, it's, he says, he says, I don't remember if it's Don TD or Dan TD. I think he says Dan TD, which is like the last way I ever would have said that. (laughs) Well, there we go. I, I love it now. It's, it's a little Dan TD. Yeah, right. Dan it's much, Titty. Much cuter word that way, right? John Cullum, Dan Titty. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh huh. All right. So the first four chapters of this book are pretty interesting, Matt. Uh, King is isn't doing the nested story structure thing he talked about that was so cool with the gunslinger, but he is playing with structure a little bit here. Like we, we start off, we see Jake and Callahan's raid of the Dixie Pig, and then we cut to Eddie and Roland, and we see Eddie and Roland like see Susanna and see the birth happening but then Eddie and Roland cut to the raid from another perspective so we kind of see an explanation for some things that didn't quite make sense in the raid the first time around um but then we cut to Susanna and we see the birth of of Mordred again from her perspective instead of the perspective of the other two um he so he seems to be playing with with structure a little bit here he's going back and he's showing how the people are connected even though they're not together physically yeah, it's definitely allowing us to process these scenes in a very unique way. We go mm-hmm. through these events once, swept up in them, part of them, possibly, yeah. you know, maybe blowing past some details in our kind of rush to get through the scene. And then we get to see these things again, and, and you got to feel these things reflected off of the other characters and maybe pay attention to different things, different details the second time through. Um, and I think that's really cool because, in my opinion, one of the core you know lessons of drama and how drama works in stories is that we as readers or viewers we don't really feel things about stories except through what the characters are feeling Mm -hmm. um and so allowing us to kind of be in this scene and then witness the scene with a different character and see their reaction doing it this way kind of broadens and expands the ways in which we are able to feel the story yeah yeah but I, i think you're right And I think the reason the reason why it's important in this first chapter in particular is because this first chapter is all about Callahan, right? This is Callahan's final chapter. It's his final stand. It's his moment of redemption. It's his moment of triumph. And so King guides us through this chapter from Callahan's perspective, stays locked with him, and we see the events play out um, and we see his moment. And then we can cut back to it and and have the details of how how what just happened actually happened fleshed out a little bit for us but we don't have to do that in the middle of it so it kills the momentum of the power of the moment like we we, i love that because like it would i'm just imagining the scene if like callahan had gone into detail about like what was going on with roland being there and we had cut to roland and and eddie in the middle of it going on riding the wave and like explaining what that was and what was going on with it. And then we cut back to Callahan and do his final stand. If we had done this as one unit, uh-huh. I one think take. the, yeah, exactly. The, um, the emotional resonance of Callahan's final moments, I think would just kind of fall flat because it would be so mixed in with all these other characters and all these other things. But no King writes this chapter. This is one time through we're with Callahan the entire time. We see him from beginning to end and then we move on and then we circle back around um, to see it from from uh, another perspective that allows. So we, we see it from Callahan's perspective and we you're God, you're so right that we feel it that way. But then when we see it from uh, Jake's perspective or we see it from Eddie's perspective or or Roland's perspective, that it allows us to hit us again. And we see we're feeling what the characters are feeling yeah. at the loss of their friend. Right. We feel what Callahan feels the first time and then we feel what each of them feel about Callahan's yeah. sacrifice. And that that is cool. That is that is um, I, I don't know. I don't want to say it's completely unique. I'm sure someone else has done it somewhere. I just can't think of any examples off the top of my head. It seems like a really cool technique, though. Yeah. And, and in, in a book that is as breakneck as this one is, that that we are given the time to feel those the, that that all important moment from from several points of view, I think is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. And he's not like he's not a small character. Like, you know, it it feels like it because he hasn't been with our group from the beginning, but he's been there since wolves. Like he's been there for hundreds of pages, thousands of words, hundreds of thousands of words. So he's been long enough for us to really fully understand what his deal is and 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 
become beloved to us. And, you know, King has, has focused more on him than, you know, even even some of the other major characters within the last, you know, book or so of text. So, yeah. 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 All right. So let's get into it. Let's talk about chapter one. huh? Yep. Chapter one titled Callahan and the vampires. So we begin the final book with Father Callahan as he and Jake prepare to walk into the Dixie Pig and to what it turns out to be is Callahan's death. Uh, and the chapter opens when Callahan holding this powerful relic. Um, he's holding the Sculpata and with God or Gan, if it please you, speaking to him. Uh, God says he is spoken to and it says the boy must go on. The voice told him whatever happens here, however it falls, the boy must go on. Your part in the story is almost done. His is not. Um, so I, I think this is really wonderful, Matt, actually. Yeah, it's it's crazy for one thing. I mean, we get more and more of these moments where the supernatural forces are kind of dipping in to exert their their direct influence. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I, th- I think there's something kind of beautiful about this guy who his whole, you know, the whole idea of his character is he's a priest. He's someone for whom religious faith and his relationship with God has been the most important thing in his life Yeah, for m- most of his life, you know, and, and he struggled with it, but he's always kind of tried to do his best and, and lost his faith and regained his faith kind of multiple times, you could say, and to have mm-hmm. God or Gan, which it is sort of in a sense the same thing speak to him directly is a really cool notion right that to, to have you know the one character who really gets to hear the voice of gan is the priest i think that's a cool idea yeah i mean it shows it shows that god is still with him that like here at the end of his his road like he he's not been abandoned that was yeah. his greatest fear right that's like when he when he got when he failed when his he put his faith to the test and failed it and went up and tried to open the door to the church and it burned his hand he said i w- i was rejected by god god doesn't like me anymore and here god is saying i'm with you here. here here's what i need you to do um your your time is almost up here but also like i feel like callahan's been on borrowed time since he jumped out of <laughs> a window yeah. um and, and so like I feel like he's he's like, as we'll see through this chapter, he's OK with it and he's settled on it. And I mean, part of that is his understanding, you know, like Gan says to him, your part in the story is almost done. And that is metaphor, but it is also literal, right? right. Like that, like that. It, and Callahan knows that Callahan knows he is a character created in a story. He knows his life is a story and he knows his part of the story is almost done. It's kind of like stranger than fiction, right? That that wonderful movie that i love so much yeah. um where a character realizes he's part of a story and he knows it's time for him to die and he accepts that yeah um, he's at peace with it yeah that's yeah. that's a good point a good comparison yeah yeah um so yeah like we had all the death flags last book and then we have god speaking directly to our character saying you go and die yeah. <laughs> and so like we go into this chapter basically knowing that for sure that this is going to be the end of callahan um but first we have to cut over to jake for a little bit as the two walk through the doors jake is thinking about roland once taught him and we have this part where it says jake went to what he sure what he was sure would be his death remembering two things roland deshane his true father had said Battles that last five minutes spawn legends that live a thousand years. And you needn't die happy when your day comes, but you must die satisfied, for you have lived your life from beginning to end, and Ka is always served. Jake Chambers surveyed the Dixie Pig with a satisfied mind. So we get this moment where Callahan has God speak to him and says, you're going to die. And then we get this other moment where Jake looks at the enemy standing in front of him and it's like, okay, I'm going to die and I'm yeah. cool with it. Um, He's ready to die. His, yeah. his, his, you know, his true father, which, you know, you could, there's always the comparison of God, the father. So it's almost like their two, their fathers both kind of spoke to them in this moment and said, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to die, but it's okay. Uh, although Jake yeah. doesn't die at least, you know, yet. <laughs> yeah um so. yeah i mean uh, yeah because because the uh, the the, mo- the more powerful father gone has said no yeah. he's not gonna die he must go on yeah he's gonna yeah. go on right right yeah i i love this and, and i love like the the true father th- that is such a wonderful comparison to callahan's father um and to jake's father being their their higher power their god that's great but also this is the start of a trend that happens in this book where like we get a little bit eddie also looks at Roland and what he sees is his father, right? So we're getting this thing where the Katet is speaking about each other 
in family terms more than they ever have, right? Like you, you talked about way back in Wolves of the Cal. I remember this specifically where you were like, you know, I, I always liked that they were just like a group of people. And then they started talking about like Din and like they added structure to it. And you didn't really like it because it's like, I didn't like like this, this, this seniority aspect being invaded into this group of people but now we seem to be on the other side of that where yes roland is still din he's still leader but he's also father he's they are family and and not just family in like the found family sense of the word but almost here it's saying true father that like jake chambers his biological father was never his real father his father was always roland Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's really powerful yeah, I think it's really cool. I, I I was thinking about Susanna and I was kind of asking myself, would Susanna say at this point, like, Roland is my father? And I, and I was mm-hmm. like, I don't know. I don't know if she would. Although then I remembered that Mia literally said like, well, we've got this prophecy about incest and I'm assuming that means the child is a child of you and Roland because Din means father. Mm-hmm. And I'm like... Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's there. But it, it, I'm, I'm also sort of wondering, like, is there a direction this story goes where uh, Susanna and Roland become closer before, before Susanna inevitably dies? Because I predicted that's going to happen. Um, <laughs> um, I don't but know. yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it. Like, I'll just there's one there's one weird thing, like, like kind of feeling that I have about this is like I feel, I feel like we're like a hundred pages away from the end of the book. You know what I mean? Like sure. that's, that's what it feels like. But like you just said, we've, this is the longest book we've got, got the, a huge amount of book ahead of us, but it's just, it's such a feeling of urgency and, and, and everything is, you know, we got, we got major characters dying here. And, uh, so just, I don't know, it, it's, it's a strange, it's a strange and, and unique feeling for, for the beginning of a book for me. Yeah. Yeah. This book is a marathon. But it's a marathon done by like those professional people that run it in four minute miles the whole uh-huh. time somehow. Yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> that's what this book is. Uh-huh. Um, awesome. So, yeah, I think you're going to have that. I think they're, they're, I think they're, they're going to be, you know, like, like in any story, they're going to be rising tension and there's going to be moments of escalation and, and where the pace and the tone really pick up and go frantic, frantic. And, and that's we definitely started this book that way. And there's going to be moments where the book kind of slows down a little bit, that, like any story that is going to have that. But I do think this book has more frantic, uh, like crazy, fast paced. It feels like things are coming to a head moments than any other book in the series. So uh-huh. All right. I think cool. I think that's not a feeling that's going to go away anytime soon. Interesting. OK, cool. Yeah. So the three of them, and I'm including Oi in this because don't forget Oi's there because our guest last week yelled at me for forgetting about Oi. And yeah. I still I haven't stopped thinking about it because I feel so bad. So the three of them are hopelessly outnumbered, but Callahan holds up Susanna's schooled pata and every low man and vampire in the room is immediately mesmerized. It doesn't work on the creepy bug things hanging out under the table, but that's what Oi is for, Matt. That's what Oi is made for. They they reason for a second. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome moment. This implication that like the universe made sure that there was a Billy Bumbler in their little tribe because eventually you're going to need that Billy Bumbler to k- kill these rats specifically <laughs> yeah. uh, in this in this important fight. Um, although, of course, there have been other times when Oi was useful, like in uh, mm-hmm. in Lud. But uh, yeah, um, but like it makes me very sad and like afraid to frame it this way, to frame it as like the reason for Oi was to kill these rats because it's like, well, if this was really the reason for all, if this was his purpose in the content, well, then he served the purpose now and he's not needed anymore. And that's bad. That is, that is terrifying. Matt. Yes, exactly. So, so the story, I'm just, I'm just saying because the story framed it for us that way, right? The story said, yeah, hey, that's what he's made for. It's like, oh, oh, if you think about that, it's, <laughs> it's bad news for, for Oi. Sure. Yeah. I have nothing to add. There. all right good dad um what we learn is that this this artifact also does not work on the type one vampires or as we'll learn later uh, the grandfathers some of the oldest vampires some things that come directly from the prim we're told um and they suddenly bust in from the other room um and and swarm our characters but as this is happening suddenly roland is there 
And we hear the voice of Roland say, go, Jake. The low men and women in the Dixie Pig, whether in thrall to the Skullpada or not, murmured uneasily at the sound of that shout. And well, they might have, for it was not Callahan's voice coming from Callahan's mouth. You have this one chance and must take it. Find her. As Din, I command you. Jake's eyes flew wide flew wide at the sound of Roland's voice issuing from Callahan's throat. His mouth dropped open. He looked around, dazed. So obviously, because of the way King has chosen to do the structure here, none of this makes any sense to us at the first moment of reading it, right? We're like, how is this happening? How is Roland speaking through Callahan? And and we'll circle back around to the the how of all this. But I also, I think the, the book has just like spent so much time with this magic link between members of the quartet, even though you don't get it, you just kind of roll with it. You're just yeah. like, yeah, sure, whatever. Okay. Yeah, I mean, some stuff happening here and, and a bit later um, actually makes me wish that I'd been even more free with my speculations earlier in the series because like the <laughs> the idea that the characters are speaking in each other's thoughts um, like via time-traveling spirits um, was something that occurred to me. <laughs> At, at a, like at a different point in the story where it's like someone has a thought and we're or, you know we've had conversations where it's like why why is you know why does it always seem like sometimes like eddie will hear roland's voice or jake mm-hmm. will hear eddie's voice or, or or what have you or you know roland's always hearing the voices of Vene in court and it's like well some of these are some of these are, are sort of clearly being conveyed as like oh he just he's just remembering it but some yeah. of these are like no no it doesn't really make sense that he'd be hearing this voice right now like it seems it seems a little supernatural and the thought occurred to me at the time like well what if they're like casting back these like psychic messages in the future to kind of like guide <laughs> you know and and it's like well i kind of wish i had said that now because that's literally what's happening in the scene um but but the, the thing is like you just said like kind of kind of weird psychic stuff like this has been happening for so long it's it never quite to this extent but i think it's been building up so that when this yeah. happened i was just like Okay, this is more of the unexplained psychic stuff. In fact, this is the rare time that it actually gets explained. So, yeah, right, right. Um, and we'll get to that explanation in a bit. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, in this moment, finally, after one final urging from Jake, in which Oi is threatened, not Jake, but Oi is threatened, he finally takes off and sneaks out of the room uh, just as the Type 1 vamps converge around Callahan. And just like Callahan's old friend Barlow from Salem's Lot, they descend on the priest. And just like in Salem's Lot, Matt, the priest holds up his token of God to push them back. Callahan strode briskly towards the others. His fear was gone. The shadow of shame that had hung over him ever since Barlow had taken his cross and broken it was also gone. Free at last, he thought. Free at last. Great God Almighty, I'm free at last. Then, I believe this is redemption. And it's good, isn't it? Quite good, indeed. And this is what I love about this, because... He's speaking not as I recognize that this is the the moment of opportunity I have to redeem myself from my past failures, but he is speaking of it as a person who knows they are a character in a book who has recognized that this is their moment in the story where they get their redemption. Right. And that fact is freeing to him, you know, like there's this wonderful thing where sometimes the the greatest fear comes from uncertainty where we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if we're going to be strong enough. We don't know if we're going to be powerful enough. And I feel like Callahan in this moment recognizes that I'm in a book. This is my end. And look at this. Look at how the creator has laid this out for me. I'm back here surrounded by the same type of vampire that I failed to the first time. Oh yeah. This is my redemption. Uh This is the moment where the author gives me my redemption and so I'm not afraid anymore because I know that I, I, I have seen the script and I know what's going to happen here and I'm free. I'm free. That's, I don't have to be afraid anymore. That's great. I honestly didn't see it that way, but I, I love that reading. Um, I, I actually just saw it as like he in that moment realizes that he is getting his redemption for his mistake previously. But yeah. but the idea that he's recognizing it as a story trope is is fantastic. I love that. Well, and and the thing that I love about it is I think it can be both, right? And I think that I think the recognition of it as a story trope doesn't take away from the importance of the moment of him finally recognizing where his power lies, right? Because the next thing that happens is the grandfather's challenge Callahan to throw his silly bauble aside. And we know from the last book that he's learned something about these silly baubles and these silly relics and these silly totems of power. 
is that they're just symbols and they're not where the power comes from and he doesn't need them. And so Callahan in this moment says, I needn't stake my faith on the challenge of such a thing as you, Sai, he said, his words ringing clearly in the room. He had forced the old ones back almost to the archway through which they had come. Great dark tumors had appeared on the hands and faces of those in front, eating into the paper of their ancient skin like acid. And I'd never throw away such an old friend in any case, but put it away? Aye, if you like. And he dropped it back into his shirt. Several of the vampires lunged forward immediately, their fang-choked mouths twisting into what might have been grins. Callahan held his hands out towards them. The fingers and the barrel of the Ruger glowed as if they had been dipped into blue fire. The eyes of the turtle had likewise filled with light. Its shell shone. Stand away from me, Callahan cried. The power of God and the white commands you. And so, in a recreation of his stand against Barlow, instead of testing his faith, he just embraces it and he, yeah I'll, you want me to put this cross aside fine i'll put my cross aside i don't need it it's just a thing through which i channel my power you know what else is these hands yeah fuck you it's such a badass moment i love it so much yeah it's it's amazing yeah i, I mean I, I love i love the idea that the the vampire again sort of tries to make the symbol be the focus because yeah, yeah. Li- like it like it worked last time it, you know if you make the symbol the focus and then the symbol falters then you're like oh the cross has failed me and and the truth mm-hmm. was like no no it was your faith in the kind of unlimited power of god to just deal with this for you that failed you yeah. um mm-hmm. and uh and and here he has no you know his faith is completely unshakable and that's you know the definition of of redemption i think in this particular case yeah yeah uh, eventually, though, no matter how shiny his hands are, the Tahin, the combination of the Tahin, the vampires and the Loman get the better of Callahan. And in one big moment, the Skold Pata is knocked out of his hand. And King writes, it tumbled to the red rug, bounced beneath one of the tables. And there, like a certain paper boat that some of you may remember, passes out of this tale forever. I just had to pull that because I think even you know what that's referencing, right? I understood that reference. <laughs> yes, that is the paper boat from it. Um, which he does, I think he says a very similar thing that it passes into the drain and out of the story. Um, and I just love that he's like, how, he keeps turning the meta dial up. And like, not only has he made himself a character in the story in which he's actually writing the story, but now he's just like not referencing. He's not like saying, oh, this is kind of like the deadlights. And he's not saying like, oh, this is the the super flu from the stand. He's just like as a narrator winking at his constant readers and being like, you get that reference, right? Yeah. Do you, do you get it? Yeah. Do you get it? Now that he has, now that he has pulled what he pulled with that chapter and, 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 and with the, uh, with the epilogue, um, he can, he can do this sort of thing whenever he wants. Right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and we'll, and we not only accept it, but, but it like enhances the story in certain ways. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things we didn't talk about this book um, is dedicated specifically and only to his constant readers. Um, he, and he, he normally puts a constant reader dedication in each of his books, but he also like thanks his wife and his publishers. And, and, but very specifically at the beginning of this book, this book is dedicated to you, my constant reader. And I feel like this is just another one of those, like, I know the, those of you reading this, I know you will understand. And this is for you. Yeah, that's really cool. Mm Mm-hmm. But it doesn't matter, Matt, that he lost this gold pata because Callahan has been redeemed. And after shooting uh, the Tahin and then shooting uh, one of the grosser looking low men, uh, he turns the Ruger on himself and he fires. Heil, Roland, he said, and knew the wave. They are lifted by the wave that he was heard. Heil, gunslinger. His finger tightened the trigger as the ancient monsters fell upon him. He was buried in the reek of their cold and bloodless breath but not daunted by it. He had never felt so strong. Of all the years in his life, he had been happiest when he had been a simple vagrant, not a priest, but only Callahan o' the roads, and felt that soon he would be let free to resume that life and wander as he would, his duties fulfilled, and that was well. May you find your tower, Roland, and breach it, and may you climb to the top. The teeth of his old enemies, these ancient brothers and sisters of a thing which had called itself Kurt Barlow, sank into him like stingers. Callahan felt them not at all. He was smiling as he pulled the trigger and escaped them for good. So this is a, a beautiful moment, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this is 
it's it's interesting because it is suicide. And and I want to I want to capture this moment for a bit here because the, it's such an interesting journey that Callahan goes on to. Right. He is he is a character who is defined as an alcoholic priest who is struggling with his faith at the end of uh, Salem's lot. That faith is tested and found lacking. Um, and then it, it spirals him and he turns into this wandering person who's like perpetually drunk and, and running from his problems and, and running from his faith. He, he thinks God has abandoned him. So he's abandoned God. Um, he takes his life uh, at, at a high point of, of these wanderings, um, finds his way back into the story, finds his way back on this path, eventually gets to a moment of redemption. And that moment ends with him once again, taking his life, committing a sin, right? Suicide for yeah. Catholic priests is a a a sin that will lead you to eternal damnation. Yeah. Mortal sin, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's 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 very interesting because one of the things that I also noticed in this chapter that jumped out to me is when uh, Callahan is looking around and seeing these people and the, these the, everything in the Dixie pig and the the hideous abominations one of the things he says is i regret standing so firmly on mia's abortion right susanna's abortion like Uh i regret i regret like i should have just not stood in the way and let them do it that was the right thing to do and that's fascinating because we talked about it then about how this was like a, a a callahan trying to find his faith and and his belief in in a higher power and what all he had done was grip onto the dogma again right he had yeah. just said abortion is wrong it doesn't matter when it doesn't matter where it doesn't matter the circumstances i don't care if it's a demon growing inside of you abortion is wrong if this is wrong 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 and there's no exceptions yeah. and i think here at the end i think he's found faith outside of dogma right he's he says in this moment that oh actually in this in this case it was probably the right thing to do and here he takes his own life and it's not this is a mortal sin that's going to damn me forever because that's what that's what my my catholic dogma says it's this is the right thing to do i have redeemed myself i have i have done what has been asked of me i have fulfilled my role i have and i am free now and that is that is like him i think that's such a clever way of representing his acceptance and rebirth in faith that's separate from like what the what the rules of that faith are right yeah we talked like two weeks ago about the idea that you know he he had in really fairly rapid succession had a lot of interaction with henchick and then had a lot of interaction with um the other preacher whose name I, i'm blanking on but the, the you know basically two wildly different interpretations of um you know, being priests of the white mm-hmm. people who were dedicating their lives to God as they saw it. And, you know, they both had their own kind of weird dogmas. And, it, yeah. it, you know, from 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 a non-Catholic point of view, Catholicism is a weird dogma, too. So <laughs> I, I think I think him going through that process and meeting those men may have been, you know, the reason why in this moment he's able to just be like, I think we're all the, the people who are on the good side are on the good side and the people who are clinging to dogma um, might be closer to the bad side than the good side. You know, it reminds mm-hmm. me of the uh, the woman in the the supermarket in um, the mist, where yeah. it's like she's you know she thinks of herself as a servant of God, but she's completely burdened and, and controlled by dogma, and she's not serving yeah. anything close to the white and you know the, the the better angels of our nature. You know, the the good impulse in humanity. She's just executing her weird her weird specific dogma. Um, yeah, same thing with Sylvia Pittston. Yeah, same thing with yeah. Um, or Carrie's mother, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think it's great. I think it's great how we've built to this moment, and it's it's easy to kind of lose track of these things where, from you know, King has been building, I think, toward this moment ever since Callahan was introduced, and it's taken us weeks to get here, but yeah. the thread has been very continuous. I think all that time. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about this redemption a little bit. Sure. I know you wanted to talk about that. Yeah. I mean, so it's a great story moment. And I want to talk about like the, the abstract idea of redemption in stories because I, f- sure. I feel like it's a term that gets used a lot when talking about stories, the, the, the term redemption, often in places where it doesn't really apply. Like, for example, I, I think, in my opinion, Darth Vader isn't really redeemed. Uh, he just finally makes the right choice one single time after <laughs> 20 years of doing war crimes. Um like that's not that's not redemption that's that like redemption specifically refers to atoning for a mistake like that's the yeah. definition of the word and and so 
you know, the question here is like, for what sin, for what mistake is Callahan being redeemed? And then I think another interesting question that I was thinking about is to whom is Callahan being redeemed? Mm. Um, because it's, it just kind of strikes me that, that if somebody's being redeemed, it's like, well, to whom are you being redeemed? And in my, in my opinion, the sin, it was just the sin of forgetting that the power he serves is too great to require that he, you know, hold a cross. Like he, he, he forgot, he forgot his faith. He lost his faith. That was his, yeah. that was his mistake. Um, the sin of weak faith. And I think the person to whom he's being redeemed is himself, you know, and and that's why this feels so satisfying. And it feels such a, it feels like such a great moment because there's no external agent really who, you know, who he's making this up to, you know, he's making yeah. it up to himself. And, and that's, that's why it lands so hard for me personally. Yeah, no, I, I love that framing. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things I struggle with in storytelling is when we tell redemption stories, um, and I'm putting redemption in quotes there. Yeah, right. we almost we almost always end with the death of the redeemed, because we don't actually know what to do in stories <laughs> <laughs> when like a character is really awful and then makes one heroic gesture. Because like, imagine Star Wars if Vader didn't die, and then they get down to Endor and they're like, so yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you helped me kill the emperor. Um, but remember when you killed yeah. all those people yeah. for like 20 years and right. stuff? This is going to be a trial and you're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. We actually, we actually do need to put you in prison right now yeah. and never let you out. Um, yeah. I mean, and that's, that's what like, it's, it's such an easy thing to do because you can at least say, oh, well they did a nice thing and they were punished via their death, but they did a nice thing before they went. And that, that is supposed to give you some, so, some feeling of closure and, and, and you feel good about it. Um, but it, it, it's a cheat kind of because yeah i mean like you're gonna if if, if someone uh, sacrificing your life is like the biggest sacrifice you can make in our world basically because you only get one of those as far as we know um and that's a huge deal so that in our in our storytelling calculation is well that redeems everything because that's the one life you've had and you've and you've freely given it in this moment but yeah i mean i it always does kind of fall flat because it doesn't make up for everything, but you're absolutely right that no one is holding out forgiveness for Callahan. Like everyone likes Callahan. Yeah. They're, they're his friends. They, they don't feel like he did anything wrong. Yeah. Um, the boy that he didn't protect in his moment of failure doesn't die in Salem's lot. The boy survives. And, um, so he's not seeking forgiveness for anyone but himself. And he does get that. And so it does feel like redemption. You're absolutely right. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I, I think I think that's critical. The thing that he did, it was a mistake and it's a thing that he regrets, but it's not really a thing we hold against him. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think that I, I, I'm just I'm belaboring it because I think it's worth, you know, paying attention to when something works this well, especially when you see it not working well so many other times. Yeah, I also really like it to get a little meta, and I think it's I think this is the one book series that it's okay for us to get meta. Um I look at it as an exploration of who Stephen King is as a person in 1976 or 7 when Salem's Lot came out and who he is as a person in 2004 when he's writing this story. Because a young a young Stephen King had this really gnarly idea where we're going to take the priest. We're going to test his faith and be like, ha, your faith is lacking. God is not strong enough to protect you here. Priest, you lost and you're punished for it. Now you've, you're turned into a vampire yourself and, and the church has rejected you. And that's a very young Stephen King, dark, gnarly idea. And I think 20 odd years later, 30, um, he looks at that and says, I want to turn this into something else. I want to turn this into uh, that faith is actually super powerful still. Um, and, and I just read, I just reread a book called Desperation, which is a book he wrote in the nineties, the mid nineties, which is a book all like entirely about the power of faith and how God is an asshole, but also incredibly powerful and will guide you to what he needs you to do still. And so I think this is a thing that Stephen King just has on his mind a lot in this period of his life. And I just liked, like, I don't think, I don't think, 
the Stephen King of the seventies writes this conclusion of this character. Um, so I see it as a, an evolution of who he is and, and what he believes as far as faith and God and all this stuff. Yeah. I think that's really cool. I mean, it, it, it does, it does work fascinatingly as a sort of referendum on his past self to say like, okay, this character who you just kicked in the nuts and just sort, sort of, I don't, I don't actually know what exactly happens to Callahan in, in Salem's lot. Like, I, I don't know how, how he ends that story, but to basically for King to say like, okay, but then what, then what mm-hmm. young Stephen King, like, like you're not, you didn't really finish this story. You just said, you know, and, and then, and then bad thing happened. But like that, that man has to keep living his life. What does he do now? And it's so much more interesting. I agree. Like that he, that he goes on to have this journey where, he he does continue to struggle for many 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 years. He continues to struggle, um, but eventually, you know, finds finds redemption for that original mistake. And um, yeah. I mean, you could even say the mistake of you know thinking that the cross was going to kill Barlow when it, when in fact it it was his own you know the power of his own faith that should have killed Barlow. It's 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 more than that, right? It's it's maybe he sh- if he had had enough you know faith, he could have use that to to deal with his own alcoholism earlier. I don't know if King is saying that necessarily, but um I mean I know that King 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 does AA, right? Or did at one point. Am I making mm-hmm. this up? Yeah. So like faith is a big part of that. So he, there could even be a, a kind of a read here where where he's saying like you, if you really have the appropriate level of faith, then it would have you wouldn't have even gotten into that position in the first place because you wouldn't have you know, struggled with this, with, with this personal problem. I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, yeah, kind of riffing there. I don't know if I'm, I, I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but, uh, I get what you mean. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but, um, I get what you mean. Um, so that, that's it, Matt. That's the death of Callahan. Yeah. It's great. Rest in peace. One chapter down and already lost the character. I know. Let's, let's keep up the pace. <laughs> All right. So we move on to chapter two entitled Lifted on the Wave, where we cut back to Roland and Eddie leaving Cy King's place to head to Turtleback Lane, the center of the walk-ins. Uh, they're trying to plan their next move, and they're stressed and trying to hurry because, as Roland says, everything's breaking at once. Suddenly, they're hit by a wave, a wave that lifts them up and out of this world, quite literally. This was very likely what Vinay had called Devin Cal, which is... It did, it, did I say that right, Matt? Yeah, David, sure. David and Cal? David and Cal, that, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. David and Cal, words which meant lifted on the wind or carried on the wave. Only the Cal form, instead of the more use, usual Cass, indicated a natural force of disastrous proportions. Not a wind, but a hurricane. Not a wave, but a tsunami. The very beam means to speak to you, Gabby, Vinay said in his mind. Gabby, the old sarcastic nickname Vinay had adopted because Stephen Deshane's boy was so close-mouthed. His limping, brilliant tutor had stopped using it, probably at court's insistence, the year Roland had turned 11. You would do well to listen, if it does. So, okay, a couple things. We have this whole new term, this whole new thing that's happening that we've never heard of before that suddenly is happening. The beam is talking to them through this wave and sending them where it wants them to be sent. But also, I do think there are moments in this book where I think King is intentionally channeling the gunslinger and him going specifically back like Vinay and, and court have always been a near constant presence in, uh, in Roland's mind, but they have faded a little bit over the course of the books. And I feel like he's bringing them back big time here. And we're about to go back to a memory of his mother and spend a bunch of time on that. So it feels like we're channeling the beginning again here with him constantly thinking about his past and specifics of his past, like, like for him to go into the detail of Gabby, right. Is, is, is very interesting and, and intentional to me, it feels. Yeah. And we're going to also mention Popkin in a little bit, Mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. not a callback all the way to the gunslinger, but a callback to very early, you know, just, just first meeting Eddie Roland. We're Uh, playing the dark tower hits here, man. Yeah. But like you said, they're all, very early Roland, like pre pre meeting the new Cotet Roland, right? That's the um, that's the vibe here, and I, I agree with you. I think um, um, I think there was one more. I, I blanked on it, but I'll try to pull it out when we get to it. But yeah, sure. the, the absolutely, um, absolutely vibing on the, the this is you know maybe maybe now that Roland is getting closer to the tower, he's 
getting more in the mindset of, of the relentless hunter that he used to be before he before his friends kind of softened him. Yeah, that's interesting. And not good, right? Not good. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So the Dave and Cal takes them to the room in which Susanna and Mia are currently giving birth t- together. Um, at some point, Susanna looks over and sees them floating there and whispers one word to them, a word that will later comes from Mia. And that word is chasset. And that word triggers a memory for Roland, a memory of his mother. We see here, the windows of the nursery had been stained glass, representing the bends of the rainbow, of course. He remembered his mother leaning towards him, her face pied with the lovely various light, her hood thrown back so he could trace the curve of her neck with the eye of a child. It's all magic, and the soul of a lover. He remembered thinking how he would court her and win her from his father, if she would have him, how they would marry and have children of their own and live forever in the fairy tale kingdom called All Aglow, and how she sang to him, how Gabrielle Deschain sang to her little boy with his big eyes looking solemnly up at her from his pillow, and his face already stamped with the many swimming colors of his wandering life, singing a lilting nonsense song that went like this. Baby bunting, baby deer, baby bring your berries here. Chusset, chisset, chasset, bring enough to fill your basket. Oh, man. A lot there. Uh, lots, lots to talk about here. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Bunch. So on the, sur- on the very surface level, as we were just talked about, we're once again playing the hits and returning to a thing that happened very all the way back in the gunslinger where Roland had this nursery rhyme stuck in his head. Um, and he, it's this, this same one, baby bunting, baby deer, chuss it, chiss it, chass it. Um, this is something that, that was in the first book and now it's here back again at the end. Um, so yeah. that's just the first level of what's going on here. Yeah. I was not expecting to, for this to come up again here uh, in, mm-hmm. in this particular way. Yeah. Um, so I'll just hit on a few other things in this passage that you read. So I love that the nursery, the nursery uh, has the stained glass window that represents the demonic soul sucking psychic orbs. Hey, they're not all bad, right? I, I, <laughs> I kind of assumed they all were bad. Honestly. I mean, we haven't met a good orb. Let's just say that. Yeah. We haven't met a go- good orb. Exactly. Um, I don't know yeah yeah i i would assume they're all bad personally so that's just a great (laughs) idea like they're sitting there bathed in the light of this thing that basically represents like in my opinion the evil the evil magic of of this world um Mm -hmm. i I love this parenthetical thrown in it's all magic um and you know we've we've sort of got this running running idea of like magic and love and humanity are are one axis and like technology and and robots and and um rationality uh, rationality are the yeah. other axis yeah um so that's 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 interesting i don't i don't know what to make of the i, I mean we know we know we know king does this thing with parentheticals a lot but i do wonder yeah. if there's more to it here well i mean it's it's, it's weird where it is right her yeah. hood thrown back so he could trace the curve of her neck with the eye of a child it's all magic right yeah um yeah then of course we've got this Oedipal thing, uh, yeah. this, this, you know, relatively extreme Oedipal angle, um, which King is, he's putting very much front and center. Like it's not subtle. Um, yeah, no, I mean like he, he's, he's said Oedipal before, like he said, and later Susan taught me about Oedipus and I was mm. like, oh yeah, that was totally me. But yeah, he's, King's bringing it back here and, and having these childhood fantasies play out. Um, and so the, I mean, the question is why is Roland remembering? Why is this? It, it, we didn't just trigger a memory of the nursery rhyme. We triggered a memory of the nursing rhyme in which Roland goes into detail about his dreams of marrying his mother and, and, and this life that he never got to live and could never get to live because it was this, this childish innocence about how the world actually works where you don't even understand why that's not a thing you can do yet, Roland, because you're too young to actually grasp that. Um, it's, really fascinating um it's really fascinating I, i'm not honestly not sure what to make of its inclusion here yeah um i mean you know uh it makes me wonder how far we're gonna go with time travel if you know what i mean <sighs> jesus man <laughs> he's not he's not gonna fuck his mom <laughs> all right uh, i i I do really love I'm trying to move on from that. I do really love this quote of his face already stamped with the many swimming colors of his wandering life. Right. So we have like 
the bends of the rainbow from the nursery glass are 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 tossing color on his face right and and these are the many swimming colors of his wandering life uh, that's it's so it's so wonderful and again i think it lends credence to your idea of like the the, the contradiction of this this ner- innocent nursery being having light bended through uh these these terrible orbs i wonder yeah. where the pink light is currently landing on the, him that's what that's exactly what i was gonna say i was like uh, like the the pink light is obviously a big part of his wandering journey and i was like mm-hmm. would they put the black like would they put a black pane of glass into a stained glass window to represent <laughs> black 13 for for that's, a nursery like <laughs> that's a good question yeah like uh, you gotta wonder i mean they probably would these people are pretty metal yeah i bet they would i bet they would so, but the the important thing here, or the most important thing beyond the fact that Roland wants to bang his mama, is uh, this chasset word, right? And we learn here that actually what the what the nursery rhyme meant, what chasset chisset chasset meant, was just seventeen, eighteen, and of course, nineteen. Uh-huh. Um, so that's that's what we got here, right? That's, huh, huh. I mean, it's interesting because. It's just 19, but like, it's just 19, right? 19 mm-hmm. is uh, what, what, like, <laughs> like, of course it's 19. If you're going to have yep. a message, like if, if somebody in this book handed you an envelope with a piece of paper and they were like, this is a secret message in the envelope, you'd just be like, is it 19? <laughs> and be like, oh man, you ruined it. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. Like it's, well, I, I guess I, I didn't expect that that would be what the message was. I thought it would be something other than 19 this time yeah um, yeah and of course the question we immediately have is okay what does that mean and that's kind of what roland's question is right they they a, a, after as soon as Susanna gives that message they're pulled away and then they're sitting there floating above the dixie pig now watching uh jake and callahan in their final stand and roland is still having this thing turn in his head he says chuss it chuss it chass it roland thought as he looked at his son a boy so small and terribly outnumbered in the dining room of the dixie pig Chasset is 19, enough to fill my basket, but what basket? What does it mean? Um, and he doesn't know. He doesn't yeah, know. Yeah, I think it, it's it, this, you know, storytelling wise, this feels like the kind of thing where he'll know it when he sees it, you know, mm-hmm. he'll he'll see a door and it'll be door number 19. He'll be like, okay, we got to go through door number 19 or. Yeah, know. I mean, we get, we get, the book doesn't come right out and say this, but it, it seems like the door that, that we end chapter four with Susanna sitting by the password to activate that door is going to be Chasset. Um, we don't know for sure, but that seems like the conclusion that Susanna comes to. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> once again, though, Roland thought as he looked at his son, right? As he looked at his son, there, there's no, like Jake is my son, That uh-huh. he just says it. He just says it. And, and the irony of course, is that he just left Susanna giving birth um, to his son um, and cuts over to his, his, his other son (laughs) yeah yeah and he was just with his mom and i mean yeah there's there's all these family can you know obviously we're gonna have this moment later with eddie and Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's uh it's getting very family up in here Mm -hmm. so we now kind of get an explanation as to what what happened in the dixie pig last time around roland and eddie in the middle of their wave toe dash thing uh went inside callahan and spoke from his mouth with their voice to get Jake to move. Here's the interesting thing about this, Matt, that neither tried to speak to Jake from within his head. Like like we see in this moment, Roland goes inside Callahan and speaks directly to him. We see like he's Callahan and Roland have a conversation. And then when Jake is not moving fast enough, Roland takes over Callahan and orders it. And then a little bit later, Eddie takes over Callahan and also orders it by saying the thing about Oi. But neither of them like try to go in Jake, <laughs> right? They they don't like they don't try to go in Jake and like convince him via their mind meld. <laughs> they just use Callahan as a tool to accomplish this. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, you know, it's I didn't really think to wonder in the moment what the deal was. A couple of possibilities come to mind for me. Like one is that Callahan was just kind of more open to such a thing in that moment because he's already kind of speaking to God. Sure. And, and maybe it was easier to communicate with him. Uh, and another would be maybe Jake's touch would have like messed it up somehow if they had tried to. Um, but to be honest, like I don't like either of those explanations. Uh, a lot of the details of how and why the scene went this way to me was just sort of like, because that's the way King wrote the book. Um, 
but you know i'll be pleasantly surprised if we get actual reasons why they talk to callahan but not uh not jake later i don't i don't uh not to spoil thing. i don't think that's gonna happen i just okay. kind of i i have headcanon that the reason why is because at this point in the story jake is still the boy uh-huh. and callahan is just a tool at this point like he isn't he is in the, the final moments of his life and existence in the story and he is just being used as a, a, a method of advancing the plot and so they don't think to use Jake that way. They don't think to get in Jake and and push Jake. It's just let's use the tool we have, which is Father Callahan. Uh huh. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that makes sense too. I do want to focus on something that I think it's it's really important here. So we do learn that it was Eddie that spoke about killing Oi first, right? So Roland is screaming at Jake via Callahan saying, you have to go, you have to go now. And he's like exasperated because he's not moving. They're going to kill you. You have to go. And none of it's working. Jake is kind of frozen, still unsure of what to make in this. And then Eddie goes into Oi, or goes into to Callahan and says, they're going to kill Oi first. They will take you both and they will make you watch. They will kill Oi and eat Oi and make you watch it. And, and that's what finally makes him move that not saving himself, but saving someone else, but saving Oi. And I think it's perfect. I think it's perfect because Roland can't see that, right? Mm -hmm. Ro Roland, Mr. Sacrifice my pawns to get my mission cannot understand the type of person who would be willing to sacrifice themselves to help out someone else. Um, but Eddie can of course eddie knows jake and eddie can see that the, the the correct way to get this boy to finally move is explain how someone else is in danger <laughs> um, yeah it's perfect it's really important i think yeah because it yeah, shows yeah. Ed, eddie understands jake in ways that roland doesn't and and like mm -hmm. you like you implied there maybe can't um yeah and and showing us that eddie and jake at least in this particular way are more similar to each other and maybe will never be similar to Roland. Mm -hmm. It does show the, the ways in which they're different. It's something that even he hits his son, he calls it a son. Roland is his true father. And still there is this space between them. There's this, this difference between them and, and Eddie plugs that right. It knows what to do right away. Yeah. And it works right away. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cause I mean, it's the, the reason, um, Jake is hesitating is because he wants to help Callahan. Right. Mm -hmm. so that's already yeah. not something roland would have done <laughs> right right so, so so eddie's basically leveraging his his felt need to help people by saying look i know you want to save callahan but if you stop here then callahan's gonna die and always gonna die and yeah so yeah, yeah it, it's i think it's pretty important um you know it's a pretty important character moment for for Eddie and Jake actually. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it makes you like, I think there's moments in this, like I, I do think y one could read the moment at the very beginning of the story where Jake walks into the Dixie pig and is like channeling Roland and is like, I'm going to die here, but at least I'm going to die satisfied. And I'm like, Oh man, he's gone full Roland. And then you have moments like this where it makes it clear that no, he hasn't that obviously he's learned a lot from his dad and he's become a gunslinger, but he's still, distinctly jake and that's important and that is an important distinction yeah yeah i like that all right so we'll move on to chapter three eddie makes a call and matt this is a goofy fucking chapter in this book like it's it's wild the stuff that goes on in this chapter i love it but it is very different tonally like this is what i mean when we were at the beginning like this is a chapter it this is a section of four chapters in which one of our longtime characters dies in a in a triumphant and but, but a sad but but content way. Um, another of our characters witnesses the birth of the baby that's been sitting in the stomach since uh, the wastelands, and we watch it turn into a giant monster spider. And there's this whole chapter in which Eddie and Roland fuck around in a small town and talk about jizz on sandwiches, <laughs> and it's just goofy as shit. Like it's like these four chapters, I think contain everything that i love about the dark tower series in four chapters i i it's wild yeah because this does feel like early drawing of the three yeah where, where yeah. it's like the fish out of water humor mm -hmm. just roland and eddie sort of of humor and vibe yeah. um yeah I, I i think you're right that 
he's very intentionally calling upon, you know, he's, he's like, we're going into this last book. I'm going to remind you of all of the things that we've done and all of the things that the series has contained and made you feel up until this point. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and speaking of what we were talking about earlier with Roland constantly thinking about the past all of a sudden again, early in this chapter, we have this moment where Roland says, earth is thinking a man can't pull himself up by his bootstraps. No matter how hard he tries court had lectured when Roland Cuthbert, Elaine and Jamie had been a little more than toddlers court speaking in the tone of cheery self-assurance that had gradually hardened to harshness as his last group of lads grew towards their trials of manhood but maybe about bootstraps, Court had been wrong. Maybe, under certain circumstances, a man could pull himself up by them, or give birth to the universe from his navel, as Gan was said to have done. As a writer of stories, was King not a creator? And at bottom, wasn't creation about making something from nothing? Seeing the world in a grain of sand, or pulling oneself up by one's own bootstraps? Um, I, I love this. I mean, first of all, it's just Roland ruminating on the concept of creation and i i'm always i'm always here for any time a book like talks about creation in this way but again like we talked about last chapter thinking about court yeah. thinking about his time as a youth not not just thinking about what court said but then going into the detail roland cuthbert and elaine and jamie had been a little more than toddlers um t how court spoke a tone of cheery self-assurance that had gradually hardened to harshness as the last group of boys this is not just i remember this time court said something this is I am re-experiencing the time court said it to me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, we're reminded again of the names, Cuthbert, Elaine, and Jamie. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, mainly Cuthbert and, and Elaine, but... Mm -hmm. um, uh, Haven't heard those names very often lately, yeah. Yeah, so just, you know, re reinforcing. I, I think there's a good chance that we're going to get an extended, you know, flashback sequence to Roland's childhood or, or youth or, or what have you um, in this book, because, you know, I was, I guess that's one, that, that would, that would be one sort of explanation for like why this book is a billion pages long. And yet it feels <laughs> like we're so close to the end is that it could actually be that we like, we are, you know, maybe we're like two hours away from the end of the book, but we have to do a bunch of flashbacks, you know, I'm not, I don't know if that's a prediction or not. It's just I'm, I'm as I'm thinking through, like I, I think there's going to be more flashbacks, and and I feel this weird tone. So I'm like, well, maybe that maybe that's the the solution to the puzzle. Is you can't you flashbacks. can't make a prediction and then say I don't know if that's a prediction. It's a prediction. It, 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 it yeah. is. It's a, <laughs> it's a prediction. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's fine. So as they move to head out, Eddie realizes something. They can't head to Turtleback Lane in Lovell yet. They can't head to Susanna yet. Their work isn't done here. They own the lot according to this piece of paper, but they have to get it in the hands of someone who can trigger it, their whole Operation Defeat Evil Through Capitalism plan. They need to get it to Moses Carver, and they need to convince Moses Carver to help them out. And um, how the fuck are they going to do that? I have no idea. <laughs> well, the solution, as Roland realizes, is their, is their Dan Titty, <laughs> their little savior. <laughs> It's John Cullum. John Cullum, who didn't seem that interested in heading up to Vermont. He's back, Matt. He's back in the story. Did you see that coming? Oh, this is just so surprising. <laughs> um, it's not, though. When, it? when, when, he was, when the story was like, John Cullum definitely didn't seem like he was actually leaving, but then he left. <laughs> and then we didn't talk about him anymore. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. I love this part, though. I guess he really didn't want to go, Eddie said, but that doesn't mean he's still at his house in East Stoneham. He is, though. He didn't go. Eddie managed to keep his mouth from dropping open only with some effort. How can you know that? Can you touch him? Is that it? Roland shook his head. Then how? Ka. Ka? Ka? Just what the fuck does that mean? Roland's face was haggard and tired, the skin pale beneath his tan. Who else do we know in this part of the world? No one, but... Then it's him. Roland spoke flatly as if stating some obvious fact of life for a child. Up is over your head. Down is where your feet stick to the earth. <laughs> I think this is fascinating for a couple reasons. Uh -huh. Definitely. Eddie, how do you not understand? <laughs> like, how do you not understand Roland's concept of Ka yet? Like, this is, we're book seven. Like, how are you so sure about this, Roland? Ka. Of course, Eddie, that's what he, that's what he does. That's what he always does. Right. 
Right. Right. I, I mean, I think in this particular case, it's just opaque to him how this is Ka exactly. I mean, so so to sure, me, sure. to me, what to me, this is the clearest example of of Ka being just the conceit of the storyteller. It's yes, yes. It has to happen this way because this is the way the story is. <laughs> like, <laughs> how do you how do you know it's him? Eddie asks. Well, he's the only named character in this part of the story. So who, who else is it going to be? Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be parsimonious storytelling to introduce a new character. It's got to be. It's got to be Cullum. Have, just, have we have we actually had that conversation yet the idea that Ka, Ka is, is just the the conceit of storytelling that Ka is literally just the story have, I don't know if I've said exactly those words I think I think I've m- maybe we phrased it before as like Ka is is whatever Stephen King needs to happen here yeah um I, I mean, Ka is, as I think it has been said explicitly, is the will of Gan. Uh-huh. Um, but if Gan is the storyteller and the 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 force in which has Stephen King create stories, then yeah, it's just the script. Yeah. It's just the manuscript. That's that's what it is. Yeah. So or- why is it? It's like like and that's what it's always been, right? Because remember, yeah. I mean, we were talking about way back in the earlier days of the book charles dickens and the the coincidences that happened in in the world of charles dickens where characters run into characters they know and and they were trying to explain the these happy coincidences and it's like well that's just that's just the conceit of narrative storytelling right. where it's it's like when you watch a when you watch a show a, a weekly show and you see an actor that you recognize in a guest role you're like, oh, that's going to be someone important. Yeah. <laughs> because they're an actor you recognize. It's the same thing. These, It's a named. Who else is it going to it, be? It's absolutely crazy when you think about it this way, because then then if if this is really what Ka is and you think about Susan and and her her like complete awareness that it is Ka that is responsible for her death, she's basically aware that. The like it's more entertaining for this to end sadly that's Ka. This is a better story if she gets burned to death. That's Ka. Ka is like, there was no higher purpose in Susan being burned to death. It was just, well, this is a better story if it goes this way. Well, okay. I don't, I don't think every character who drops the word Ka has, has the understanding of the truth of their existence, right? Like, I don't think like when people say Ka, what they're saying is the conceit of the story. I think they're, putting a word to a thing that seems to happen in their lives where where the the conceit of storytelling will swoop them up in into events that they are seemingly unable to to break free from um is the word that they've assigned to this but the truth of the matter is when you dig underneath it this is what this is what it is this is the source of it um yes i mean i didn't articulate that cleanly enough i I think that you're exactly right, but the the fact of the matter is that, like, as as far as the story is concerned, Ka indeed did cause Susan Delgado to die, and it was because Stephen King wanted to write a Romeo and Juliet tragedy. Yeah, yeah, like that. It, it wasn't because there's some, you know, ne- necessity. You know, the, the necessity was just got to tell an entertaining story. Yeah, but when you dive down to it deep, isn't that that's every story? That's like yeah. the, the that's the, the the honest truth of every story is every tragic, every moment of of death of depression and destruction and misery that you you read as you turn the pages are just there to entertain you. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And of course, I mean, I think I think like I, I think that's it's not that it's a shallow read but it's it's bigger than that it it, like well storytelling like that's that the problem with that conclusion is that that assumes that storytelling in and of itself is unimportant right which is i think i think the 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 series explicitly says no storytelling is one of the most important things um and so yes it the, the the reason susan died is because it's makes a more interesting roland character and we like to read about Roland. Yes. But also the story of Roland to Shane is really important because of what it can do and what it can create and how it can make people feel and, and the power of storytelling. Right. So it gets back to this whole thing. So, yeah, I mean, I don't want to I don't want to just dismiss 
tragedy in stories is utterly meaningless because it's all about just having fun i think this is not why, entirely it i think this is why king keeps saying stuff through roland like people can study Ka their whole lives and never really fully understand it because you're exactly right there like it, it is more than just like like the way the mist ends that's Ka. <laughs> um but but yes. that's but that's not to say like just that's just because they wanted to write a really fucked up ending that would that would hurt your feelings and make you leave the theater angrily like it, it's 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 more than that right it's people are trying to do more than just just tell a good story or or another phrasing is a good story is more than just a story so yes. so ka is more than just the conceit of storytelling it's the it's everything wrapped up in why people tell stories yeah um i like, why do we I, create i think yeah. i think i think we finally understand ka though <laughs> it took <laughs> until the last book but um and maybe we've hit upon like certain variations of it up to this point but yeah i, I yeah. think I, I think it's probably more accurate and kind of all-encompassing to say that yes ka is like the rules of storytelling and 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 the purpose behind storytelling rather than just to say ka is whatever Stephen king needs to happen Yes, yes. Okay, it, the, cool. it is both. And it is more than both. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So um th- so this next section, Matt, is you're absolutely right. It is drawing of the three to a T. So we have Roland and Eddie in town, and Eddie's gotta make a call. The title of the chapter. I, I love that it works in both ways, right? Eddie makes a cause and Eddie makes a decision, and Eddie makes a call as an he calls uh, call him on the phone. Um, but then we have this moment where he's like, I'm hungry, Roland. You got to go get me a hoagie. <laughs> yeah. And we get this hilarious scene. If you still got at least 16 of those money coins left, tell them you want a hoagie. Roland nodded, which wasn't good enough for Eddie. Let me hear you say it. Hoggy. Hoagie. Hoogie. Ha- Eddie quit. Roland, let me hear you say po- poor boy. Poor boy. Good. If you have at least 16 quarters left, ask for a poor boy. Can you say lots of mayo? Lots of mayo. Yeah. If you have less than 16, ask for a salami and cheese sandwich. Sandwich, not popkin. <laughs> and I just have to say, the way the audiobook reader says lots of mayo was like the funniest <laughs> goddamn thing I've ever heard. Because it's, it's like Roland says it as if he's just repeating the sounds and doesn't understand that it's lots of mayo. Mm-hmm. It's it's God. It's so funny. I'm still. Yeah, well, and then later Roland brings a sandwich back and is like, I don't understand why you like your sandwich with this jizz looking stuff on uh-huh. it. Like it's it's hilarious. Yeah. And it's like I said, it's in the middle. It's sandwiched in the middle of a scene in which one of our beloved characters dies and a monster spider baby is born. And there's this this comedy scene. It's wild. And I, I do think, I really do think that King is consciously playing the hits. He's consciously looking over his books, especially the early ones, and channeling the energy of those books. And I think it's great. I think it's really great. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. All right. So there's another really important beat here, Matt, that I, I want to take some time on. So Eddie is on the phone trying to get get Cullum. And we hear, after a brief wait, the directory assistance operator coughed up Cullum's number. Eddie tried to memorize it. He'd always been good at remembering numbers. Henry had sometimes called him Little Einstein, but this time he couldn't be confident of his ability. Something seemed to have happened either to his thinking process in general, which he didn't believe, or to his ability to remember certain artifacts of this world, which he sort of did. And he asked for the number a second time and wrote it in the gathered dust on the phone kiosk's little ledge. Eddie found himself wondering if he'd still be able to read a novel or follow the plot of a movie from the succession of images on screen. He rather doubted it. And what did it matter? The magic lantern next door was showing Star Wars, and Eddie thought if he made it through the end of his life's path and into the clearing without another look at Luke Skywalker and another listen to Darth Vader's noisy breathing, he'd still be pretty much okay. Well, he might as well be dead then. (laughs) Um, yeah, but there's I mean, this is this is a fundamental shift in Eddie as as a human being, right? Like, I don't think I can read a book anymore. Uh-huh. I don't think like I have the I have the processing power in my brain enough to read a book. Or, 
or or just like he's a different he's not he's not a person who would read a book anymore is sure. maybe like there, there's this hint that eddie has become like metaphysically decoupled from earth he, he's he's hardly even eddie of new york anymore right he's becoming eddie of midworld in, in a sense yeah um, well he, i mean here's to get meta into i i think you're right that like it, it, it operates on the level of is he a person that would read but also like look at what the words of the next thing is said or follow the plot of a movie from a succession of images on screen uh-huh. that's not i'm a person that doesn't like movies that's i don't think my brain works well enough to connect moving images on screen anymore uh-huh. i don't think the tr- like because he's talking about recall and his ability to recall and, and think and process and that's gone and he's like i don't think i'm this person anymore let me ask you a question matt eddie dean is a character in a story has eddie dean ever read a book the I mean, the person that exists it's a very fun metaphysical question because the character of eddie dean has read books in the past of the character of Eddie Dean. Yes. But we've never but the seen the physical manifestation of Eddie Dean that is sitting on the pages. In, on the pages. Yeah. Has never actually read a book. Yeah. I mean that, that that's kind of the next place I was going to go with this is is mm-hmm. like is this Stephen King basically saying um Eddie is not is is changing. Mm-hmm. And maybe even deteriorating in a certain sense. Like he he's talked before about feeling thin. Like when things get when things get to 19, things start to feel thin, things start mm-hmm. to feel fake and and and, you know, he f- feels like he's barely there kind of it actually kind of reminds me of the, the Bilbo Baggins, like butter spread over too much toast. Um, yeah. Uh, line where it's, it's like he's becoming insubstantial. And maybe now that he's learned the degree to which he is a fictional construct, he's going to become even more insubstantial. And maybe there's a relationship between those two things. And yeah. Um, I mean, I, I it, th- what this has done, what this paragraph has done, is it has kind of cued me that I'm, that I need to pay attention to like what's going on with Eddie. Is he is he really kind of deteriorating? Is he are we going to notice more stuff like this where he loses he loses stuff? You know, like like what you know is there going to be some moment where somebody's like, ah, oh, yeah, this is just like when Henry did this, and then Eddie's going to be like, who? Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, well, I, I, I'm I'm cued to pay attention to this kind of thing now. Cool. Yeah, it's a really fascinating thing, and I, and I love I love diving really deep into the the meta nature of it all. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, something's going on with Eddie Dean for sure. But John Cullum is there because, of course, he is. He picks up the phone and he says, "You know, I kept meaning to leave, but every time I was about to leave, I just found something else to do." Um, because it's Ka. I, I love the part where in his main accent he says, "You taking care of my Ka?" <laughs> <laughs> and Eddie kind of chuckles at it. Yeah, uh, that's really good. Yeah. But he agrees to meet up with the two of them and he agrees to go on his mission to New York City. Um, and because he's Dan Titi, he says, yes, I love that I get to call it that now. Thank you for that, Matt. It's, it's, it's Dan Titi. Um, he, uh, he accepts he accepts the mission. So they're on their way. Uh, Eddie and Roland are on their way to meet up with John and talking about like a totem they can give him or, or a token or something they can give him to kind of help him convince Moses Carver um, that they need to help him. And, and as they're about to kind of figure out what that could be, uh, they bump into a walk-in and we see ahead of them staggering unsteadily along the shoulder was an old man with snarled and straggly white hair. He wore a clumsy wrap of dirty cloth that could by no means be called a robe. His scrawny arms and legs were whipped with scratches. There were sores on them as well, burning a dull red. His feet were bare and equipped with ugly and dangerous-looking yellow talons instead of toes. Clasped under one arm was a splintery wooden object that might have been a broken lyre. Eddie thought that no one could have looked more out of place in this road where the only pedestrians they had seen so far were serious looking exercisers, obviously from away, looking ever so put together in their nylon jogging shorts, baseball hats, and t-shirts. So this is Shevin of Shaven, Uh a child of Roderick, um, a kind of slow mutant from not even Roland's world, but a world near Roland's world. And he's in bad shape, right? He's in, he's in bad shape. Um, and he seems rather reverential to Roland and the line of Eld, uh, who, who and Ro- when Roland sees him, he like gets out of the car and immediately chases after him. And we're like, what's going on here? Uh, but as Roland approaches him, Shevin uh, demands a sigil, a sigil from Roland um, and King zooms us back to book three. Once again, we're playing the hits. 
And we have this moment in a town called River Crossing, an old woman who had called herself Aunt Talitha had given Roland a silver cross on a fine link silver chain. He'd worn it around his neck ever since. Now he reached into his shirt and showed it to the kneeling creature, a slow mutie dying of radiation sickness, Eddie was quite sure. And the thing gave a cracked cry of wonder. So, Matt, what's going on here? <laughs> um, first thing I wanted to point out is that I don't think I I made the connection at the time that Talitha sounds so much like Tabitha, which is King's wife. So there's, there's a, maybe a reference there. But anyway, uh, what's <laughs> going on? So this is the part where it's, it's going to sound like I'm being critical. I think I'm just pointing out what King is doing in in the beginning of this book. And, and you can disagree with me or, or say you have a different interpretation, but like, if you take the Ka beam wave thing, which like teleports their consciousnesses to these specific places where they can intervene in the plot in, in, in critical ways, the John Cullum thing where John Cullum just happens to have hung around the sudden appearance of this unusually friendly and solicitous slow mutant appearing directly in their path who has exactly the information that they need. There's this feeling of just like, well, isn't all this convenient? <laughs> um, and, you know, so it's like the story is just giving them the tools and the information they'll need in like borderline intentionally transparent ways, right? Like maybe fully transparent ways. I, I don't know yet. Like that, that's, that's basically what I'm saying is like, it, it seems like King is just saying like, and then Roland and Eddie tied up all the loose ends in short order. Um, and you know, near, like internal to the story, n narrative wise, it's like, okay, they're sitting next to this important beam nexus location. They just talked to Stephen King. Maybe they get plus 15s on all their dice rolls for the next little <laughs> while. I don't know exactly, but, but like, do you, do you know what I'm, do you get what I'm sort of pointing out here? Yeah. I mean, it feels like the story is just saying we got to tie, we got to wrap all this shit up. And, yeah. and I agree with you that the the conceit of the story has made it so which all of these convenient happenings are perfectly explainable in universe. A hundred percent. King has crafted a story in which every time something convenient happens, we have a reason for that because it's a story <laughs> and right. we know it's a story and we acknowledge the story. But that doesn't mean you're shielded from criticism of when you're just kind of tossing things and, and it, it does, there were moments through reading this week's section. And I think this is one of them where it's just like, we're like, Oh shit, I forgot about the cross. I got to wrap that up. How am I going to do that? Oh, let's do it this way. Uh -huh. Um, I mean, there is like, I, I do think because he's a, a talented writer, I do think King like uses this moment where Roland puts this thing out of its misery, um, which is a kindness, but does it only after, like he he rips the name of the place that they have to go to next out of him um, in, in, in a way that is obviously making the poor suffering creature like very terrified and uncomfortable. Like like Fedek is a place where he's obviously terrified of and uh, Roland kind of demands that he get this information from him before he puts him out of his misery. And then like as he's like crying in distress at having to relive probably a very painful memory, Roland just like casually just like, Phew. yeah, so like. It's not to say that this moment with this this creature does not have its purpose because we end this chapter on Eddie looking at Roland and being like, fuck. Yeah. I still think he could do that to me if I if I am a, a, a piece on his board that gets him to his tower. I, like here, hundreds of pages of late uh, uh, later, you know, years and years later in real time, I still think that Roland is that person. Uh, I'm reminded of this. So he's a skilled writer and he weaves this to its purpose. But yeah, I mean, like we had probably we haven't talked about the cross around Roland's neck and like literally since it got put there. Right. Because it, it just wasn't a factor of the story. And they were like, oh, yeah, it, it's the cro uh, that's the sigil sigil that the thing cares about right. that we didn't know existed before. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of that. Like, I think. Well, and, and, and it's not that I dislike it. I, I do like it. I, I, but I agree with you that like you can't just blanketly say, well, it's fine because of the conceit of the story is that all, Ka is is making all this stuff happen. Yeah, I mean, I begin to 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 maybe see what like I've seen some people say like the Dark Tower, the final book, it it just kind of goes goes crazy and and there's some problems there, you know. Like I've I've seen that take out in the wild, mm -hmm. I, I, and I'm like, is this the sort of thing that people are going to be complaining about? The idea that 
there's all these sort of convenient things that happen or, you know, a word that you hear a lot is contrived. Um, you hear it applied to storytelling where it's like, you know, oh, that, that plot point was so contrived. And what, what, what they mean is like, you don't believe that that thing would have happened organically and you believe that the author writer whatever didn't know what else to do to resolve the problem and so they just kind of had uh, they just kind of forced it to happen uh, inorganically and the, the i mean i think the fascinating thing about this story is that king has very intentionally and methodically brought us into this domain where he can play with these ideas like it's not like he's unaware of the fact that yeah. this kind of feels contrived. Like mm -hmm. that's what he like. And he can clearly write books that don't feel contrived at all. He's doing this on purpose. So like, I'm not, that's the thing is I'm not complaining. Uh, and, and that's why I kind of started out this episode saying like, it's going to sound like I'm complaining. Cause normally when you call something contrived, you're complaining about it, but I'm just mm -hmm. saying he's clearly contriving these things. And in a certain <laughs> sense, everything in storytelling is contrived anyway, right? It's, it's all sure. made up. It's all made up to serve the purpose. It's just a matter of, can you make it up in a way that feels organic and natural? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I loved these chapters and I, and I, I, I adore this book a hundred percent, but I, I do, I do see your point here. And I, I, I agree with you. You're just pointing out what, what the story is doing yeah. and the story did just throw this thing, this scene in front of us seemingly randomly and we're like struggling to catch up. Um, so yeah. Uh, All right. We'll, we'll, we'll put a pin in that and see, see where else the story goes. Yeah. Um, so a couple moments before we end, I just like we have this moment in this chapter where it, it literally references child Roland to the dark tower came here um, where he says, uh, there's no stopping until we reach the tower. He held out his hand, watched them tremble minutely. Then he looked up at Eddie. His face was tired, but unafraid. I have never been so close. I hear all my lost friends and their lost fathers whispering to me. They whisper on the tower's very breath. So that, like, that's just the poem, right? That's like, he's hearing the voices uh, of the of his lost friends yeah. in this moment. That's just what the, the toll, the noise coming from the tower as he approached it. That's exactly what's happening here. So. So things are lining up to the poem pretty well here, Matt. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> and then we, we hinted towards this, but I just wanted to read this because I think it's another beat. It's another fatherly beat here. Eddie got into the car and closed the door before Roland could reply. In his mind's eye, he kept seeing Roland leveling his big revolver, saw him aiming it at the kneeling figure and pulling the trigger. That was what the man called. This was what the man called both his din and friend. But could he say with any certainty that Roland wouldn't do the same thing to him? Or Suze? Or Jake? If his heart told him it would take him closer to the tower? He could not. And yet he would go on with him. Would have gone on even if he had, hadn't been sure in his heart, oh God forbid, that Susanna was dead. Because he had to. Because Roland had become a good deal more to him than his din or his friend. My father, Eddie murmured under his breath just before Roland opened the passenger door and climbed in. My father. Yeah. Uh, God so many there's so many hard-hitting moments here I, it's easy to yeah. lose track of how powerful stuff is when we talk about it because it's like we're mm -hmm. being we're being analytical but like there's so many beats in this this week's reading that just got me and like that that him saying that and then Roland getting in and him being like you said something and he's like a little farther yeah it, it's just surprisingly powerful and i, I think that's yeah. the magic of eddie dean for me is that as a character he tends towards sarcastic humorous not serious uh, and then it hits all the all the harder when he is serious and vulnerable. Sure, sure, totally agree. Yeah. All right, Matt. It's time for a spider baby. Let's move on to chapter four. Don Titty. <laughs> it's, I'm. I, everyone's probably sick of the joke by now, but I certainly am not. So I'm going to keep doing it. It's it's a it's a funny word. So at last we return to the scene of the birth where we left Susanna at the end of book six. Six. So let's have us a. A baby, Matt. Let's do it. Yeah, this is going to be fun. And then uh, before the horror began, uh, uh, actually, this is this is a quote. Sorry, I forgot to highlight this part. But this is a quote that I wanted to read here as we get into this. Before the horror began, something so terrible she will remember each detail as if in the glare of a brilliant light until the day of her entry into the clearing, she felt a small, hot hand grip her wrist. Susanna turned her head, rolling the unpleasant weight of the helmet with it. She could hear herself gasping. Her eyes met Mia's. Mia opened her lips and spoke a single word, 
Susanna couldn't hear it over Scouther's rowling, ro- roaring. He was bending now, peering between Mia's legs and holding the forceps up against his brow. Yet she did hear it and understood that Mia was trying to fulfill her promise. I'd free you if chance allows, her kidnapper have said. And the word Susanna now heard in her mind and saw on the laboring woman's lips was chasset. So there's that 19 again, right at the beginning of the chapter map. But we see here, we get a little more information on it because to Mia, Mia is passing this word along because she believes this word is what will free them from free Mia or free Susanna from uh, her, her captivity. So why? Somehow. <laughs> yeah. Somehow. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't really get it. I mean, admittedly, this is the, this part of the story, much of the reading this week. Um, I just, I was so into, I, like it was, I, I, I was going through so quickly and just like into the moment that mm-hmm. I wasn't thinking ahead. And so a lot of details like this, I just didn't even think about at the time. I was just like, okay, the chat, yeah, all right, it's going to be useful somehow later. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Um, the only real hint that Chasset is the name of the password is when she's talking to the robot. Um, he, the robot mentions door number nine and how it has certain voice commands. And, and Mia thinks to her, Susanna, I keep saying Mia, Susanna thinks to herself, Chasset, he's talking about Chasset. Um, so that's, that's really the only hint there we don't know for sure but it seems like Susanna believes that that is that the chasset is the password yeah could very well be night yeah yeah makes sense but like in a way that you couldn't just say 19 you'd have to say chasset specifically yeah right right I I think I mean she doesn't even know that 19 means chasset she just knows the word right that's true that is true so as the labor continues the link between Mia and Susanna is finally cut for good Mia screamed again, and Susanna let out a cry of her own. Part of this was want- not wanting Sayer and his mates to know the link between her, Mia- her and Mia had been broken. Part of it was genuine sorrow. She had lost a woman who be- had became, become, in a way, her true sister. So here's the familial connections again, right? Like we have the word true father said in this. We, we have Roland referring to Jake as his son. We have Eddie referring to Roland as his father as well. And then Susanna's sitting here and she says, Mia here is my true sister which is fascinating because they don't even like each other but yeah as, but yeah. but you don't have to like your family i guess nope. um but yeah i mean it, i love how everybody's getting so so raw here you know it was mm-hmm. so so emotional um yet again this feels more like the ending of a book than the beginning everything's falling apart so quickly so, yeah i mean you know. i think this gets to uh, this could get into an argument about where these books were split up because i, I do very much think that Song of Susanna, while it certainly did have a climax of its own, um, it also ended on the precipice of a bunch of important events about to happen, right? Like we had Jake and Callahan about to walk into the Dixie Pig, um, and we have Susanna about and Mia about to give birth. So we we like we kind of we kind of ended that book mid climax. So it does make sense that these two moments feel very very end of booky because they're the climax of a, a, an event here. Yeah, yeah. You know, if I <laughs> I wonder if th- these scenes like the the Callahan and and Mia and and uh, and Susan Susanna scenes couldn't have gone at the end of the last book and then the Roland and Eddie stuff couldn't have gone at the beginning of the next book as a way of kind of backfilling what actually happened there. But I I'm not complaining about the way he actually did it. I just think it is interesting yeah. how you could have cut it differently for sure. You could have and uh, part of me my initial my gut reaction to that was to resist it because i do think that ending ending the mia stuff on the truly tragic and beautiful moment between susanna and mia allows that to stick in your mind more clearly because that's the end moment of the book with them like where this like yeah and i feel like if you have the stuff with the fucking spider and, and mia being sucked dry and that tragedy as your end point the other stuff gets a little lost and I love, I love that the attention it got the, like the, the, the moment, like the climax of me and Susanna's story is them going back to the sixties and remembering like this, this freedom fighting time and the power of that. And, and then just the simple memory of a mother saying hello to her child at the end of a day, like yeah. that is the climax of their story. Right. And I, 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 that would have, I felt been lost if, if we had packed all this other stuff on yeah. top of it. I mean that, that even, reads it it feels different knowing that she does have her child and then it immediately turns into a monster and kills her so yeah i I have to agree with you yeah so tragic yeah Yeah. 
So Susanna, Susanna gets briefly in touch with Jake via like a, a mind text, but then loses him as the labor continues. And then the baby comes. So we see it crowning first. And and then through the welter of crimson, Susanna saw a crown of white and black. The white was skin. The black was hair. And I love that we're, we're doing a lot with colors here, right? Like through the crimson, we see this kid with white skin and black hair. So we already have the white and the black. You know, we have, we, I think we learn in this chapter that that the 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 son has two fathers right and one of them is the crimson king and so like we've got this white and black going on here yeah um it's just the the duality that mordred represents um it's really great yeah but mordred is born with a full mouth of teeth and a giant boner and a birthmark on his left foot and as someone whose wife is about to have a baby in march this scared the shit out of me. Uh-huh. <laughs> but but in all other ways, he looks like just a normal baby, right? And so we're like, okay. I mean, it's weird that a kid would have full teeth on birth. That's weird. There's, that's but, such a wonderful uncanny valley thing because yeah. picture a newborn and then you just see – and it's not even like their fangs. It's just like – it it's has teeth. teeth that, that, yeah. like that you, would, you would immediately like get weirded out by that, right? Yep, yep. But other than that, he normal. And so we're just like, okay. And Mia, who we see has kind of been driven insane by both the effort and perhaps just the joy of finally getting what she's wanted, uh, takes the baby and begins to nurse him. And then despite being, you know, the prophesized doom of Roland, we're kind of in this lull until everything seems kind of okay. Yeah. And then it, and then it suddenly isn't, right? Uh-huh. Susanna saw red light run down the child's smooth skin from the crown of its head to the stained heel of its right foot. It was not a flush, but a flash lighting the child from without. Susanna would have sworn it. And then as it lay upon Mia's deflated stomach with its lips clamped around her nipple, the red flash was followed by a blackness that rose up and spread, turning the child into a lightless gnome, a negative of the rosy baby that had escaped Mia's womb. At the same time, its body began to shrivel, its legs pulling up and melting into its belly, its head sliding down and pulling Mia's breast with it into its neck, which puffed up like the throat of a toad. Its blue eyes turned to tar, then back to blue again. Susanna tried to scream and could not. Tumor swelled along the black thing's sides, then burst and extruded legs. The red mark which had ridden the, ridden the heel was still visible, but now it had become a blob like the crimson brand on the black widow spider's belly. For that was what this thing was, a spider. Yet the baby was not entirely gone. A white excrescence rose from the spider's back. In it, Susanna could see a tiny deformed face and blue sparkle that were eyes. Uh... <laughs> it's such evocative writing that's why i read it all like the horror of this moment like i love the detail of a red light ran down the child's skin it it came from without not within right yeah like it, it, it's this is something coming external to the child and it's like this thing was born in this kind of duality with the, we see the the white skin, the black hair, this kind of duality of nature where it's, it's, it's presenting as a baby. And then it's like the, the darkness, the evilness, like immediately takes it over yeah. and win and wins this tug of war. The idea of the light being something from outside gives you the impression that something, you know, touched it, right. Something yeah. from the world touched it. It, it, it might have been, it might've been a, a baby like this didn't may, maybe didn't have to happen, but um, that I don't know. I, I presume this is what the red, this is what the Crimson King wanted. Um, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, anyway, as this was happening, I was just like frozen, <laughs> like my mind was completely <laughs> blank with just like what. And and you know, like we said a minute ago, like poor Mia, right? Like we finally yeah. come to care about Mia and, and sympathize with her as doomed as she is. And and then this is like even worse than just having the baby taken away because it's not even a baby. It's a monster. And and she gets that final moment of like part of her realizing like, oh, this is this is not this is not a baby. But like her, <laughs> her mind is already so broken that she's just like, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> we'll roll with it. And she just dies. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's it literally sucks the life out of her. Yeah. And yeah. It's it is really tragic because like I just seven years, five years, three years, I'll take anything. I'll take anything. And it's just a moment, just a single solitary moment. Yeah. And then, yeah. Oh, 
poor Mia. Poor, poor Mia. Mm-hmm. But in the distraction of, you know, there being a fucking spider here, uh, Susanna is able to make her move. She grabs a gun from one of the low men and she just starts killing them all. She fucking wrecks him. It's awesome. Yeah. She even kills Sayer. And we see here that she shoots him twice, one for the pair and one for Mia, which was really wonderful. Yeah. Uh, just to, like that. I love that. Um, yeah. I love I love how they're all just even the bad guys are like frozen with shock and fear because like they're like that what uh, that i don't he didn't tell us yeah nobody told them that this was going to happen either that's a really good that's a really great detail to point out i'm glad you said that yeah like no ever no one knows what's going on here except for perhaps the crimson king right Um, and we don't i mean we again i i just i kind of surmise that like the light coming from without implied that something did this to him but Mm -hmm. we don't know whether this was intentional like we don't know if this is part of anybody's plan so yeah yeah um and so she she finally turns to take aim on mordred himself and to kill the demon spider baby but she doesn't um some poorly timed things happen you know you're talking about contrivances right there's some beneficial contrivances but here's some some bad contrivances as one of the one of the low men that that susanna had scared away earlier in the fight comes back at the exact wrong time and she trips over one as she's about to fire and so she misses she and, and we know that's a big deal because we know susanna's aim is remarkable yeah, right yeah. she's one of the best gunslingers of the three of of them trained by roland Actu- so hey, so remember when uh so this Roland set up those stones for uh-huh. her to shoot and she shoots all of them except the last one. She just clips. Yeah. And she's like, she's down on herself because she clipped the last, because she didn't hit the last one. Roland's like, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes clipping the last one is fine. Actually, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes just the fact that you injured it is enough. So I'm bringing that up here because I think that's a thing. I think that's a, interesting. Okay. How many bad guys were there? And how many rocks were there? We got to look this up. If there's the same number of bad guys as there were rocks, then Stephen King is definitely doing a thing here. I believe she says there were 11 of them. Um, I don't remember how many rocks there were. I think there were six because one for each bullet in the gun, right? Because it was a six shooter. I guess. Um, don't remember. Um, but. The important part is she just clips him. She, yeah. she takes off one of Mordred's eight legs and he says to her psychically, I'll pay you back from that. My father and I will pay you back, make you cry for death. So we will. And so he says that ominous sentence and then runs off. And that's the last we see of Mordred for now. It is interesting that the psychic newborn kind of sounds like Rhea in my head, you know, like like the, the the way the way he speaks you know he speaks the way he speaks make you cry for death so we will that seems like the kind of thing that Rhea of the coos would have said huh um i like that just, i like that yeah but like he's a newborn how he, he he can apparently talk and not only talk but sound like an evil witch I, yeah I, I so just, once ag- yeah once again for like the eighth time we've got father references here though matt like uh-huh, uh-huh. like we're we're really we're really paying close attention to familial lines here yeah yeah um i i don't know where we're going with it but yeah for sure yeah and uh, there's one more quote i wanted to to point out here um in the middle of the the fighting we have this line where it says she turned eager for more yes this is what she wanted what she had been made for and she'd always reveal revere roland for showing her like you know this is susanna in the 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 middle of battle the battle rage and yeah she just like roland before her like just kind of gets sucked into it and loves it and feels the most alive in those moments yeah right this this is the the side of mia we don't oh sorry god <laughs> I feel the name's so screwed up i know uh, the, the side of susanna we don't see that often but definitely yeah. there yeah yeah so after the dust kind of settles, susanna tries to get in contact with jake again but all she's getting back from him is one word Weem away. Any uh, any guesses here, Matt? In the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion sleeps the night. Okay, but like, why would he be saying that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I try to pry you for predictions, and, and you just you just don't want to. I uh, maybe that's the password. I mean, the song might have a clue in it. Or maybe he just happens to be in a place where he's hearing that song right now. And so that's what's in his mind. And it's not like he's sending her the message. It just happens to kind of pass through. (laughs) 
the reason I'm not being um, like overly coy about this is because if you look at the the title of the, the next chapter, um, it makes it it makes it pretty okay. obvious right away. Well, I didn't um, look because I'm a good person. Well, OK, well, the title of chapter five, which we will be covering next uh-huh. week, is In the Jungle, the Mighty Jungle. Oh, OK. So. See, I didn't look. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a spoiler full, i don't think it counts as a spoiler full credit to me i do wonder if you would have gotten there if you were just reading because like i'm sure the audiobook pronounced it weem away right weem away like, yeah but like if i had just been reading this i probably would have been Wime like why <laughs> what is what is well, <laughs> if i hadn't been doing a podcast i wouldn't have thought about it at all but um touche since touché. since you asked yes um, so then we see Susanna ask Nigel, the butler robot, who she blinded in her fury to escape from the evil Loman, um, to carry her. So he tells her about door number nine, the default door between Fedek and New York that as the doors get shut down, that it, it carries over to. And he has her take her over to, to door number nine. And as Nigel is carrying her there, Susanna starts thinking the Diem brothers are dead, she thought, remembering had it been a dream, a vision, a glimpse of her tower, something from her time with Mia? Or had it been her time in Oxford, Mississippi, or both? Papa Doc Duvalier is dead. Krista McAuliffe is dead. Stephen King is dead. Popular writer killed while taking afternoon walk. Oh, Discordia. Oh, Lost. But who was Stephen King? Who was Krista McAuliffe, for that matter? So I love how kind of introspective Mia... I, did, I wrote Mia. This time, not only did I say mia instead of susanna but i i wrote in my script mia here god i love how introspective susanna is being here like she's commenting on what she has become like we talked about like how eager she was for what roland had made her into and she comments here she she questions was this my tower like that's a member of like mia jesus susanna has never seen her image of the tower yeah um and and here she's commenting on how different she is from the the passive resistance girl from back in her freedom fighting days, the the anti violence, the passive resistance person, and she's a gunslinger now. She's a different person, and she's wondering what all this means. And then again, we have this this perpetual like re- repeating moment where Susanna is has all these important figures and dying. Uh, Krista McAuliffe, for those that don't remember, is the challenger explosion right that's the teacher who died in the challenger explosion. i think you're right which is yet another callback to not only to an early to, not only to the drawing of the three but to her own story specifically in the drawing of the three yeah um um yeah i mean so so interesting like she's kind of having these like psychic or, or in any case thoughts that aren't really hers where she's getting this litany of the dead like the you know some, some kind of radio somewhere is 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 reading off this this list of all these tragically dead figures which mm-hmm. she doesn't even know who they are um which puts her in good company because there's a lot of telepathy going around um in, in this part of the book i just wonder if we're gonna if and when we're gonna figure out what you know what this is and why yeah i mean stepping back from it, it this is something that has been uniquely her the whole time mm-hmm. like it is interesting that all of our other characters have gotten visions of the tower that have kind of pulled them towards uh, towards this quest and her visions are of discordia her mm-hmm. visions are of the consequences of failure like eddie jake and roland are all like f- like pushed towards the beauty and and the the serenity and the the wonder of this thing this nexus um but she is specifically continues to cycle back to the consequences of the fall of that nexus and that that is another way is a way in which she is unique and different yeah. from everyone else yeah i mean she's she's the one who saw you know the red light of the crimson king against the sky none of them has yeah. seen that right so she's she's seen things they haven't as well i think yeah, that's true. interesting i also Absolutely. like th- there's just kind of generally speaking about this moment you pulled out where she's thinking about how she's different now it, it to me and in in i think might mirror eddie's moment of thinking about how he's kind of a different person now right so both of these characters reflecting how reflecting on how they're not the same person they used to be um and uh uh at the start of this story i mean i I almost wonder if we're gonna get a jake moment where he thinks about how he's not who he used to be um yeah well maybe well i mean we'll find out in the jungle yeah in the the jungle jungle. yep Uh, so they walk by several doors on their way to to door number nine. And I just wanted to point out the one very obvious reference one where they see one marked Dallas parenthetical November 1963 slash FedEx. So, uh, hey, that's uh, hey, John F. Kennedy. 
I understood that reference. Yeah, yeah. So is that meant to imply that like, so how do the door, like, because like, the doors are one way, right? Uh-huh. But how does the one way work? Is the first word where you come in? So is is that 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 the person on the grassy knoll escaped through the door back into FedEx? After that? <laughs> is that is or, that what happened? Or, or you know, you you go there to shoot him, and then you're either stuck there, or you maybe find some it. other door. I don't know. So Lee Harvey Oswald was actually a low man. But it's he, funny because there's like an entire book about um about <laughs> the assassination of JFK. It's called 11, uh, 2263 that King wrote. Not He hadn't written it when this book came out, but um, I think it comes out in 2011. It's quite good, actually. It's one of his, I think one of my favorite of his 2010s works. There are magic doorways in it. I don't want to spoil okay, it for fine. you. Don't tell me. <laughs> All right. So finally, Susanna and Nigel get to door number nine. And Susanna doesn't want to go through yet. Um, because she's got to wait for Jake and she can't get in touch with Jake. So she just kind of is forced to like sit there and wait. And I guess I, I, what I wanted to do as we approach the end of this week, I want to talk about Nigel here because he's an interesting character, right? He's he's another robot. He's a robot that our character is blind once again because they know their weakness is to just shoot out their eyes. And Nigel reacts in the typical blinded robot manner, which is that he freaks the fuck out. But unlike every other robot or AI we've seen in the story so far, Nigel seems just kind of harmless. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. I agree. Because Nigel, in a sense, sucks because he's working with these evil low men and other servants yeah. of the Crimson King and he's in Fedic, right? So you're like, okay, yeah. he's obviously a bad guy. But then you get the impression after she blinds him and then starts talking to him, you get the impression that he's just really stupid. Like mm-hmm. he's just kind of a tool that was made for this one function. It's kind of all he can do. Yeah, um, nobody says nobody says Nigel the 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 um, Butler robot many other functions. Right. Nobody says good that. good point. Good point. Yeah. And and <laughs> and you know what else would you expect of a Butler robot other than to serve the people who he's instructed to serve? So, sure. like I, he he's not he's not gonna like single handedly figure out morality so that he can be a good <laughs> a, a, a good robot, right? So like sure. it, it, there's a kind of tragedy to him where he's he's doomed by his own nature. Um, and, yeah. you know, you, you feel bad for him as, as, as he's like, you know, my eyes are broken, probably not going to ever be fixed. I'm, I'm kind of just doomed to this blind existence now forever. This sucks. Oh, well, see you later. Yeah. I mean, it is part of this general, like the decay of the world, mm-hmm. right? Like there's just this, like, this is just a world that has been since forever breaking down and decaying and when things break in this world they don't get repaired you break nigel he's not going to be repaired and he knows that accepts that and i mean there is something i I don't want to say beautiful but like it's just like a person there's so much in this book the early parts of this book about people just accepting that this is the way I'm, i'm gonna die here this is my this is my role this is my the will of my existence yeah and nigel is kind of another example of that where he's just like yeah it's kind of scary i guess but like there's there's nothing i can do I, like yeah yeah and Susanna, Susanna wants to reassure him too which i think is the most adorable part where she's like yeah you'll probably yeah uh, you'll you'll probably find you. some eyes yeah of course not he, i'm kind of shocked that you're still here actually nigel yeah he's he's by far the least evil robot that we've encountered so that's yeah. Which, which it's a big deal. Yeah. It it is right. It's interesting because we talked before about like the very nature of the robots is to be the pink, the 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 you know life without the capability of of you know true you know living and it's the lack of magic. Right? Yeah, yeah, the, the lack the, of magic, the lack of humanity, the lack of heart, and it's like, well, you know, he he is working for the bad guys. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but he seems to be capable of like sadness in a in a fairly genuine seeming way so yeah poor nigel yeah poor nigel goodbye nigel so that's it that's it for the chapter we leave Susanna just sitting by the door waiting and hopefully she'll get in touch with jake soon but we'll find out next week because next week we are moving on to chapters five six and seven of part one we're actually finishing part one of the story next week by reading those three chapters so that's what we're going to do next week and I can't wait to talk about it some more with you, Matt, because I'm I'm loving this. Me too. Book seven. I'm loving it. All right. 
All right, let's move on to our discussion question. Uh, as last week was our overview, we did not have a discussion question going into this week's episode, but I'm going to make it up for you because we got two. <laughs> we got two because I couldn't decide between them, and I and you had the good idea of just just picking both of them. I, so I like both of them too much. We're going to ask you both of the questions, and here's what I'm going to say. You can answer both of them if you want. But we don't have time on the show to read every person's response to two questions. So if you answer both of them, I'm just going to pick the one I like more. But if you just want to answer one of them, knock yourself out. So yeah. uh, here are two questions. The first one is, what is your favorite moment of earned redemptive, uh, earned redemption in fiction? What is your favorite moment of that? And maybe try, maybe try to make it like, I, I think I put earned redemption in there specifically because like, I think this goes back to what Matt was talking about earlier with like how often redemption isn't really redemption in stories. It's just the character dies. So, so tr really think about that. What's your favorite, the best earned redemptive moment in fiction for you? That's question number one. And question number two is a little bit more fun. What's your favorite creepy baby? There's lots of creepy babies in stories. What's your favorite creepy baby? Yeah. Babies are kind of an intrinsically creepy thing. So creepy, <laughs> especially when they have teeth, creepy yeah. baby teeth. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So answer one or both of those questions and I will choose my favorite of your two answers. Uh, so that there it is. There it is. I hope you guys enjoy those. I'm having fun. You, I thought about this, Matt, and we there's only I only have 11 more questions to ask. Oh, wow. Before we're done with the Dark Tower. I know we better make him count. Yeah. <laughs> Creepy baby. <laughs> All right, folks, that is it. That is the end. Uh, thank you so much. Next week, as I said, we are going to finish part one, The Little Red King. We'll be discussing chapters five, six, and seven. And don't forget, don't forget, the schedule is out there. Uh, we actually have gotten a lot of people that said they've just been listening to us. They haven't been reading along with us. But but as we approached book seven, they said, I want to read this one along with you guys. I want to read this book again, and I want to read it along with you. So if you want to do that, the schedule is posted on the show notes on every single one of our episodes so you can see exactly how we break down each chapter each week how many chapters we're covering so just click on that schedule that hyperlink in the show notes and find the schedule and you'll always know what we're doing but next week part one the little red king chapters five six and seven yeah and remember you can reach out to us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on twitter at kingslingerspod and of course the subreddit at r slash doof media um is is a pretty a happening place where people answer the discussion questions pretty often it's pretty happening that's right <laughs> if you're not already subscribed to kingslingers we got 12 episodes left i say that i mean we have a bunch more after that too where we cover the other book and some short stories and stuff but we have 12 episodes left until until the end of this book so now's the time to subscribe you can find us on itunes stitcher spotify youtube google play and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can get those cool things called podcasts yeah, those round discs of podcast matt that's not how podcasts work what have you been that's doing how i get podcasts um <laughs> i'm imagining you <laughs> downloading a file burning it onto a cd and then and that's how you uh, listen to every single one of your in, podcast putting in a walkman that i bought in a 95 <laughs> yeah um and if you like any of our shows and you want to support them consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doof media. Speaking of which, special thanks to new patrons this week, Bidoofs, Lou D, and Nate D, uh, new doof dancer, Chris F, and new doof trooper, Robin D. Welcome, welcome, and we hope that you enjoy the cool stuff uh, that we have for you. This this last uh, weekend, we did a, a, a hangout session where we, um, we read through a spec script for the hit 90s TV series, The O.C., no, no, Matt. Two thousands. Two thousands TV series, The OC. And we we and all the other doofs read read through that and, and performed it, and it was really fun. Yeah. And uh, that's the kind of top tier content that you get from uh, subscribing. The best thing I can say about it is I told Matt that the character he was playing was from Brooklyn, and so Matt immediately decided I'm making this guy sound like Eddie Dean, and yep. that's what he did. That's what I did for the whole show. <laughs> It was really great. I loved it. I had a lot of fun with that. So yeah, that is available at the Doof Dancer level and above. That's our five dollar level. So the uh, the recording it's not it's not a recording, but it's just the the YouTube is still the link is still out there for folks if you missed it on Saturday night. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. 
But of course, if you cannot afford to donate to us right now, that is absolutely fine. You are still being a huge help every time you share this podcast, every time you talk about us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Reddit, on any of those social things. Talk about us on TikTok. I want to see some Kingslinger TikToks, damn it. Or if you don't want to have TikTok, you can just... <laughs> You can just uh, help us out by leaving a rating and a review. This week's spotlight review comes from Duckstar, who gives us five stars and says, finally, I wanted to make a second trip to the tower, but I did not have a book club or any friends for that matter to discuss it with. This is a great way to reflect. And the guys really break it down and point things out that I never noticed before. Well, I'm so glad you said that Duckstar, because that's our job. Our, our job is to hopefully point out some things that you might not have noticed before and just break it down and just have a good time while doing it. That's right. So thank you. Thank you so much, Duckstar. We really appreciate that. And we appreciate every review that you guys have done and every TikTok that you guys have made because we love <laughs> TikTok here at Doof Media. We definitely know exactly what it is and we love it. Just can't stop talking about t- TikTok on, <laughs> over here at Doof Media. All right, folks, we will see you right back here next week as we continue the final novel, The Dark Tower. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number, Dan Titty. Dan Titty.